Evening, everybody. I'm Roy Epstein, uh, chair of the Belmont Select Board, calling our meeting to order on September 18th, 2023 at 7.01 p.m., joined by Vice Chair Elizabeth Dion. Good evening, everyone. Member Mark Paolillo. Good evening, everyone. Town Administrator Patrice Garvin. Good evening. Assistant Town Administrator and wearer of many other hats, Jennifer Hewitt. Good evening, Roy. And uh, a lot of people in the audience. So uh, let us begin with our, oh, we have two public hearings tonight, one at 7.15 and one at 7.30, and we will start those promptly. Uh, so let us begin with community announcements, of which there are two, I believe. You have to give me a second. All right. Uh, so I can start talking about the first one. Uh, we have received a significant uh, grant to do improvements on Grove Street, and there'll be a public session on September 21st at 7 p.m. to get public comment uh, on what people, I guess, would like to see done on Grove Street. This is the section from, really from Belmont Street all the way to um, uh, the traffic circle at the far end. Uh, this will be virtual, I guess, live and virtual. It says, it says virtual participation is encouraged. What does that mean? No. Sorry, you were reading the wrong, wrong one. The wrong one. Okay. Uh, this is not a select board event. This is a transportation advisory committee event working with the town engineer's office. And uh, I guess for that reason, it will be a virtual event only on September 21st and the Zoom details uh, will be on the town calendar. And the uh, <clears throat> second item is a, a select board event, which is public input regarding the fiscal 2025 budget. And <clears throat> that will be a week later, September 28th, uh, starting at 7 p.m. And that will be both uh, live and virtual um, virtual participation is encouraged, although we're happy to see you down here too. Um, and the Zoom details will be on the town calendar. Uh, okay. Are there any comments from residents for items that are not otherwise on the agenda? Uh, if you do have a comment, please come to the microphone and identify and identify yourself. Patrice, can you me a Hi, good evening. My name is Joan Horgan. I live on Wiley Road. And I am the coordinator of the Hope Welcome Circle. And we're sponsoring two families from Ukraine. And a week ago Sunday, we had a big concert here across the hall and a fundraiser. Um, and I'd never undertaken a project of that scope before and didn't anticipate how complicated it could be and all the little details that needed to be attended to, uh, especially dealing with the audio and uh, amplification system. Um, some of the performers needed to access their music for dancing and singing through YouTube and uh, through the amplification system. So thankfully, Pamela here referred me to the Belmont um, Media Center and Jeff um, Hansel. very graciously uh, agreed to help us. Uh, he explained what needed to be done, but with very little, within a few days of the concert, he also offered to come and be at the concert for the entire duration uh, with an assistant so that we could have the audio system working properly. At first he said that would be a cost and I was very happy to pay anything to get some professional assistance. Um, and there was no one on our welcome circle who had the skills or expertise to operate the amplification system. Um, I wouldn't even know how to connect the performers to YouTube, etc. But when Jeff realized, you know, that the concert was a charity for these Ukrainian families, he offered to waive the uh, cost 
and which would have been, I believe, about $450. And basically, he donated his time at the time of his assistant, and that meant an awful lot to us. It meant that more money went towards the families, but it also made our presentation of the concert professional uh, versus amateurs, which we were, definitely. And the assistance of the Belmont Media Center was absolutely necessary for the success of our concert. So we greatly appreciated it. So this contribution by the Belmont Media Center shows a level of personal and organizational commitment by the Belmont Media Center and what they contribute to the community. And that is invaluable. And also as a member of the Belmont Religious Council, I'm very aware of what the Belmont Media Center does you know, for other events throughout the year, especially the Martin, Reverend Martin Luther King celebration every year. So I'm here to urge the select board to get the best deal you can with Comcast <laughs> renewing their uh, license. Thank you. Uh, so that the Belmont Media Center receives the maximum amount of funding possible through this new agreement with Comcast. And I also would like to ask the select board to help sustain the Belmont Media Center into the future, as this organization is invaluable. It's an invaluable asset to our, our community here in Belmont. Thank you. Thank you, Joan. That's an excellent uh, illustration of why the Media Center is such a huge resource for Belmont and Jeff Hansel. I think we've all had our own experiences working with the Media Center and finding the, the thousand and one ways that they've been helpful in, every, in so many different events. And Jeff in particular has just offered his time and expertise on countless occasions and they're, they're just terrific. And the use of the auditorium was a big help to us. Good story, thank you. It was really successful, and we got a lot of compliments out of it. Beautiful. Thank, thank you. you very much. <clears throat> thank you, Jeff, if you're listening. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right, right, right in front of you. Where is he? Oh, there he is. Thank you, Jeff. I thought you were behind the camera, but uh, I didn't look up. We thank see you, Mr. Hansel. We see you. Uh, we, I really enjoyed working with you, and that was really nice. <laughs> All right, we can move on to the uh, town administrator's report, Patrice Garvin. So for you tonight, I have my monthly bulletin, a lot of good information in regards to meetings, upcoming meetings, uh, departments, uh, information. I also did a community, imp uh, sorry, uh, an employee spotlight. Uh, this month we spotlight uh, Leslie Davison, the new Belmont town treasurer slash collector. So, a lot of good things there, and we'll be sending it out and distributing it tomorrow. Second item, update on the status of the green space in front of the Underwood pool. This is really just to inform the board that we were, um, we were asked by the, the Belmont Library Building Committee um, what to do with the Golden Bowl uh, at the end of, of the project, and the instruction was to put it back to its original uh, state prior to use. So they needed an answer right away, and that was the answer that we They had. asked us, or we asked them? They asked us. Well, how, what condition we wanted it in after the, yeah, yes. of course. Right, so just yeah. letting you know. Thank you, yeah. Um, the next item is an update on the high school debt summary. This was something Jennifer uh, reported out to the Warrant Committee this past Wednesday, and we're gonna walk you through that. I should say this is something that originated in a public discussion here a couple of weeks ago, and we have promised this information. Great, thank you very much, Patrice. Would you mind making that just a little bit bigger for me? Thank you. Great, so. <coughs> all right, so what we, uh, what we wanted to do in sharing this was <clears throat> just start from the, how much debt has actually been issued so far and, and how we've been doing against what our original projections were. So originally the, the overall total project cost is, and this number has been consistent throughout, is 
initially there was there was some initial design work that was done um, prior to the MSBA acceptance and, and other other activities and I'm not going to be able to speak to that in detail but that was um, that was sourced from the Kendall Fund uh, or a like a like fund that was used for the, the design work so then the original authorization uh, the bond authorization that was approved at town meeting uh, back in 2018 was $293,409,189. That's inclusive of the MSBA dollar amounts because that was a condition of our grant is that we had to provide if for some reason the MSBA backed out that, that we would be able to issue the entire, the in, in, in completely we'd be able to issue the entire amount. That obviously has not happened, um, but that was one of the conditions of the grant. So when you, we got to phase um, the, the, so far we've issued three different um, phases of debt, one in 2019, one in 2020, and one in 2022. Uh, for the first two issuances, some premiums were received for those amounts, but those were added and um, to the issuances themselves and resulted in a total of $100 million in each instance for um, in revenue to the town to use for the purposes of funding the project. So overall, we have issued $212,765,000 in debt. So far, we've also received 16, just shy of 60 of 70 million uh, from the MSBA. Uh, that comes off of the overall debt, the debt authorization. Um, we are expecting to receive another five and a half million from the MSBA prior to them starting to hold back. Uh, they routinely <clears throat> offer, they hold back about 5% of the project and we're not 100% sure what that number is gonna eventually be. So I'm just, I just did the math on what 5% is and that's what we're expecting them to hold back. <clears throat> it may be a little more, it may be a little bit less, but then they, they conclude their audit once we pay all of the bill, all of the final bills of the, once we pay all of the final bills of the project, then it goes into an MSBA audit where they're reviewing all of the intricate details and looking to confirm or deny or ask for further information for, mm -hmm. you know, the, all the myriad level of details that go into this project. At the conclusion of that audit, which would likely be sometime in 2025, uh, they would release the portion of that holdback that is deemed eligible for the, for the project, and then the town would need to um, come up with the difference. So at this point, because we, we do have a project agreement letter with the MSBA for 79,436,265, prior to any disallowances, um, we are left with a, um, a remaining uh, authorized and unissued amount of 1.2 million, just, just north of 1.2 million. Um, there had been a conversation um, at the prior bond, at the prior board meeting about what, how, about bond premiums. And I just wanted to say that uh, in the original um, language that was approved at town meeting, there was this clause that is, is shown here that allows that any premium received goes to offset the overall debt authorization. And so while the 2019 authorization was for 24.4 million and the premium was 5.6 million, the total revenue was 100 million and that 100 million came off of the original author authorized amount. Similarly for the 2020 issuance, um, there was not a premium for the 2022 issuance. So Jennifer, Jennifer go ahead. I'm gonna have to interrupt you here. Yes. And uh, because it's 7.15 and we need to open the public hearing, but we can return and finish up after the Excellent. meetings. Two public hearings are over, but uh, sorry, but with that, uh, I'd like to invite Glenn Clancy to come up uh, because we're going to have a, or Glenn Clancy and Jay Marcotte, it looks like both department heads are here um, to explain uh, revisions to the existing stormwater management bylaw that we have, and then we'll open it up for public comment. Or do we have to vote to open a public hearing?
Um, Just opened it. So you did unilaterally. Okay. So we should come back to that discussion because that was very yes. helpful. I think we need to roll through it again. Good evening, gentlemen. Good evening, uh, Mr. Chair. Good evening, everyone. I, I asked Jay to join because uh, Jay and I have been working together on the MS4 issues for uh, quite a while, and we will continue to do so as we move forward. Uh, I've asked Patrice to promote. Uh, Jennifer Zappo, who is the consultant that we are working with at Stantec uh, on our MS4 uh, and our stormwater issues. Um, so I don't know if Jennifer is, is that a way for us to know. Can you guys hear me? Yes. Yes. Jennifer, okay. can you hear us? Yes, I can. I'm just, uh, I'm reading from the bylaw where it says these are against yeah, I have, so, yeah. First, I have to ask the audience to be quiet because these microphones pick up everything in the room and uh, speakers should identify themselves. Uh, so Mr. Chair, Glenn Clancy, the town engineer for the town of Belmont. In the administrative section um, in the bylaw, it says the select board shall adopt and may period periodically amend rules and regulations mm -hmm. relating to the requirements, procedures, administration and enforcement of this bylaw after conducting a public hearing to receive comments on any proposed rules and regulations. Uh, so the reason that we're here this evening is, um, as you may recall, the original uh, stormwater bylaw was adopted back in, I believe it was 2012, uh, and the subsequent um, initial set of rules and regulations were adopted in 2014. Uh, it, at the annual town meeting in 2022, we uh, made some significant upgrades to the bylaw um, in an effort to stay in pace with uh, EPA and DEP requirements for stormwater and MS4 permitting. Uh, and so now we find ourselves having to update the rules and regulations in order to keep up with the bylaw that was just recently adopted. So I know that Jennifer has prepared sort of an outline of uh, the items that we've addressed in the draft rules and regulations. And if I could, I would like to turn it over to Jennifer and, and have her um, make her presentation. Sure. That's okay. So Jennifer, you can feel free to jump in at any time. Okay, great. Um, so my name's Jen Zoppo. I work for Stantec, a stormwater consultant, and I've been working with Belmont for about, probably about two years now on MS4 compliance. So as Glenn mentioned, um, the stormwater bylaw was recently updated last year, and um, there are now proposed revisions to the stormwater regulations. Um, these revisions are driven by the town's MS4 permit. So I want to just give a very quick overview of what that MS4 permit is um, to give an understanding of kind of why this is um, why this is coming up and why this is happening. Um, so the town's MS4 general permit was effective in 2018. It is issued, jointly by the EPA and the Massachusetts Department of Environmental Protection. Um, so MS4 permits are NIPDES permits. That's a National Pollutant Discharge Elimination System permit. It authorizes discharges of stormwater to surface waters. So effectively, it allows the town to operate its stormwater system. Um, the goal of the MS4 permit is really to ensure that water quality protections that are required under the Clean Water Act are being met. Um, you know, we know that stormwater is a major cost, uh, major cause of water quality impairments. And so the MS4 permit is a really important um, tool and it's a, an important step to help um, reduce those harmful impacts um, of stormwater to our local water bodies. So that's kind of what's really driving this. And, um, the other thing I just wanted to mention about the MS4 permit is that it is a general permit, which means it applies to all phase two communities in Massachusetts. Um, so there are over 260 communities that uh, are falling under this MS4 permit. So this is not unique to Belmont. This is something that um, communities across the state are, are all um, dealing with. Thank you, Thank you Jennifer. Uh, so with that introduction, because uh, just being mindful of the time, if there's any public uh, comment or uh, questions regarding this uh, bylaw change, please either come to the microphone or raise your, raise your Zoom hand and we will recognize you.
And while waiting for uh, possible questions to come up, I, I take it, Glenn and, and Jay, that by adopting this bylaw, we will then be in compliance with current regulations, or is there something more we need to do? So, so uh, Mr. Chair, Glenn Clancy, Town Engineer. So the, the bylaw that was adopted by town meeting last year is the most up-to-date version at this time. Um, this is an, an ever-moving, ever-evolving program. Um, if you look at the documents from EPA, they have mapped out a time frame of 10, 15, maybe even 20 years into the future on what their goals are and what the expectations they have for municipalities to be in compliance with these permits. Permits have a five-year cycle. And so every five years, they within the five years, they're, they're ratcheting up requirements. And then every five years with the issuance of a new permit, they're ratcheting up the requirements as well. So um, as I stated earlier, the, the, the amendments to the bylaw uh, that we do through town meeting and then the uh, updates to the rules and regulations are all aimed at staying uh, staying in good stead, I guess, with EPA and their requirements. So as once with the adoption of the rules and regs before you this evening, we will be in as good a position as we can be in at this current time. So Glenn, to clarify, Nothing needs to happen at the bylaw at the current time. This isn't going back before town meeting. If we adopt this tonight, then we're fine. When do you next anticipate that town meeting will need to look at this? Boy, I don't, Jennifer, you any idea on the horizon when the bylaw would have to be tweaked again? Um, not really. Um, I think the next iteration of the permit, if we're lucky, we might see a draft of it in the spring, um, and that might give us an idea of whether there will be additional changes that need to be made. Um, but, but, there's no, but there's no further action by town meeting at this point to achieve the necessary level of compliance now, I take it. That is correct. Yeah, right. Okay. So if, if I may, uh, so we adopted this bio last in at the annual last year, correct? Yes, you, you may have 22. You, uh, Not we, the town, town you, meeting. You adopted the latest version of the bylaw. That's correct, Mark. And so when, would they, when was that effective? These rules and regulations that we're now adopting tonight sort of allows us to enforce the bylaw that was adopted in May 22. So the bylaw was effective upon its adoption by town meeting, okay. I understand it. Uh, as, I, as I mentioned at the beginning of the meeting, the bylaw has the provision for the select board to adopt rules and regulations. So this, this is that follow-up step. We, we had a set of rules and regulations that we've been using to implement on projects. Okay. But what we want to do this evening is update those rules and regulations to reflect any of the changes that were made to the bylaw last spring. So we had rules and regulations that we were, we were operating under prior to the rev revised bylaw that we adopted mm -hmm. last May. These rules and regulations now allow us to expand in the changes we've seen in the red line to adopt these rules and regulations to comply with uh, the revised bylaw. That's correct. To enforce them, you say. That's right. Requirements of the, of, the, of the revised bylaw. Is that correct? Okay. Okay, so this is still a comment period. I see Ralph Jones has come in. Uh, Ralph, did you want to comment on the bylaw? <coughs> okay. I was about to say, Ralph Jones came in, who's taught me everything I know about stormwater management. Yeah, we thought Ralph was coming. I don't, I don't know whether to take it as a good sign or a bad sign that you don't want to comment, Ralph. <laughs> uh, okay, fair enough. Uh, uh, seeing no other uh, hands at the moment, uh, I did, the one thing I wanted to ask about the bylaw or the, the regs, which otherwise seem drafted very carefully because I can see the, the, the rounds of review that went into them, uh, it's just the fees because I don't really have a basis to judge, but it, the hookup fees seem pretty modest to me. And I wondered how were those fees determined and are they truly adequate? The, the, the fees are determined taking a best guess on how much staff time would be spent on the particular applications in the inspections. Um, I did look at them again this time and I felt like they were still you know, pretty well in line okay. with, the effort, with the level of effort from staff. And so I wasn't proposing to make a change. Okay. Without in any way questioning your judgment, I know we've been trying to ensure across the board that fees match staff time. So I appreciate that explanation. Yeah. All right. Well, I, there are no hands raised virtually and there's nobody in line live. Uh, so at this point, do we, do we need to- We need to close the public hearing and then we'll we vote. Close and then vote. Okay, I, I will move to, I guess I will, since I unilaterally open the public, now we unilaterally close it. And uh, 
I move to adopt the rules and regulations um, presented to us this evening by uh, Glenn Clancy. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Glenn. Good work. Okay. Thank you. Appreciate your work on this as well. All right. Jennifer, thank you. Thank you, Jennifer, as well. No problem. Um, so we have four minutes before the next. You want to do the update from um, on the ring public input and the family? Can you do those in four minutes? The D and E under your PA report. Yes. Well, um, sure. So you, in regards that, to, uh, if you can do it in the time, sure. Yeah, I think so. So we had a, a rink public input session on September 13th. Um, a lot of good uh, back and forth. I I think there's a few things that I still need to run down um, that came out of that meeting, and it was just an opportunity to kind of have the board just state any other public comment they want to make after that meeting. Okay. But again, I think I asked you this at the meeting, Patrice, the timing, I think you said in order to uh, allow us to, to consider whatever we attempt, what we decide to do, mm -hmm. needs to be part of the 25 uh, budget deliberation. Yes. Yeah. So is that something we need to decide? What's the timing by the end of this calendar year, do you think? So I would say by December. Okay. That's when we'll be wrapping up the, the budgets for FY25. And we don't anticipate the need to have any additional public um, public forum, but we certainly are taking into account any additional comments that residents mm -hmm. want to make. Okay, great, thank you. Uh, I appreciated the comments residents made. I actually learned a lot. There is some really good questions and a number of issues that I think we weren't aware of before. So that was very productive. And then finally, um, the family camp out at Rock Meadow was this past Friday. It was the first um, permit given by the Conservation Commission um, to sleep out overnight. 36 families um, signed up, 125 people attended. So it was really good turnout. It was very good events. And I suspect that there'll be another one next year, so. Oh, there were 135 overnight campers on Rock 125. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. That's pretty cool. Yeah. It's a dry, dry evening, presumably. Right? There were some thunderstorms at the beginning, but <laughs> they cleared up. <laughs> they God bless up. those hearty souls um, that have gone out there. So. That's great to hear. And then the other item, which Jennifer will conclude later. All right. Well, uh, we have like a minute and a half before 7.30. So I think we'll just have a brief uh, pause. And then we'll start the public hearing on uh, Comcast. Uh, I'd rather take more than a minute to yeah, think. OK, that's fine. Yeah. There's a lot to explain. I think we're running behind. Do you mind waiting? We have few. Yeah. Yeah. Well, true, true to form. Um, no. For the benefit of the public, public hearings are scheduled for a um, specific time, and we're really obligated to um, start them at the time, not, not sooner, even though. Everybody may be ready anyway. All right, it is 7.30. I would like to open public hearing for Comcast cable television license renewal. Uh, and I've been asked to uh, open the hearing by reading a brief statement, which I will do now. Does uh, CTAC need to convene their meeting first, Mr. Chair? Oh, are they, are they all here? Form? Yes, yes. Oh, by all means, please. Yeah. I am, my name is Mark Carthy, Chair of the Cable TV Advisory Committee. I'd just like to open our meeting, which has been publicly posted and ask Jonathan Burge and Chet Messer, just they're on Zoom to acknowledge themselves. Just say, each of you say aye. Oh, we need to admit them. Okay, sorry. Chet and who's the other one? Chet Messer. Jonathan Burge and Chet Messer. 
Huntington Burge and Chet Messer. They both said they're on. They are on. See them? Yep. Jonathan Burge. Burge. That's B I R G E. Yep. There. Yeah. They're in. They're in. Jonathan and Chet, could you just acknowledge yourselves by name? Uh, John Burge, I. Chet Messer. Great. We're all, we're, we're, our meeting is convened. Back to you. All right. Let me begin with reading a brief opening statement. Uh, good evening. Welcome to the Town of Belmont's public hearing on Comcast's cable license renewal. I'm Roy Epstein, Chair of the Select Board. <laughs> By way of brief background for the public, Comcast's cable television license expires on October 2nd, 2024. Federal and state laws require the holding of a public proceeding, including this hearing, to provide the public an opportunity to comment on town and public cable related needs. Notice of this hearing was in the local newspaper for two successive weeks. Copies of the legal advertisements are being entered into the record as ascertainment hearing exhibits one and two. Additional exhibits may and will be entered into the license renewal record after this hearing. Accordingly, we will keep the hearing record open for written comments for 14 days until October 2nd, 2023. Even after the closing of the hearing, the Cable TV Advisory Committee will be conducting ongoing work to identify town cable needs and will be accepting written comments separate from this hearing and on an ongoing basis. In this proceeding, we are open to accepting comments about all cable related matters of interest to the public, including customer service and the town's needs regarding important local channels the local studio and public educational and governmental access and programming. <coughs> we welcome public comments. Members of the select board may also have questions or comments. Uh, is, Keth, is Kerry Morris present? Um, yeah, she's on Zoom. Okay, has she been promoted? No. And is attorney um, August uh, available this evening, Mark? Bill August should be online. Yeah. Oh, there is Bill August. Okay. Good evening, Bill. Hi, everyone. Good to see you. Thank you. Hi, everyone. Good to Thank see you. Larry Morris from Comcast. All right. I will continue. Uh, before proceeding to public comments, I would like to briefly recognize Comcast representative Kerry Morris. So, Kerry, I don't know if you have any comments or. Uh, just happy to be us. here to, to hear the needs of uh, the town. And if anyone has any questions as well, happy to work with Bill as well. Thank you. All right, uh, now we are ready to accept comments from the public and interested parties. Please come to the podium if you're live and state your name and address if you want to comment in person. Uh, if you're participating via Zoom, please raise your hand using the raise your hand tool at the bottom of the screen. If you're on the phone, press star nine and we will recognize you. Uh, let us begin with. Um, I don't need a microphone. I uh, picks it up no, here. No, we. Anne Mann, uh, precinct four town meeting member. I'm also a commissioner of the housing authority. Have been for seven years. Uh, I want to thank you, Carrie, very much for uh, helping us <coughs> fund the Belmont Media Center. We had a newspaper in Belmont called Belmont Citizen Herald, where many people were able to get resources. Last time I was up here, thanking you for your wonderful donation. Uh, we don't have that anymore. Well, we do, but it doesn't have any local news. Um, as a commissioner of the Housing Authority, there's a lot of people that I know in Belmont that can only have free TV. The operations we have in government, our food pantry telethon, many events are held at the Belmont Media Center. I learn a lot from watching the channels that you help us provide. So I, I am a Comcast user myself, also have Verizon phone, but um, I, I want to thank you and I want to praise you for helping us help our community be knowledgeable of what's happening in town. Thank you so much. Thank you, Anne. Um, there is a virtual hand, Lisa Pargoli. Do your comments relate to this hearing? Well, actually, they were from the previous one, which you didn't allow for comments. I oh. just want to say that you people put the rink 
public output meeting on. Sorry, sorry Lisa, this, you, you, whoa, 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 whoa. Lisa, no, you, if you're not, if you're not going to comment on the Comcast matter, you, we, you have to wait. <clears throat> okay, so somebody live who would like to comment. Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. And uh, I want to also thank please you. Identify yourself. Yes, please. Catherine Bonpilio, town meeting member, precinct six, and uh, former president of Belmont Against Racism. I want to thank Comcast also for all they've done for our community. I can think of no greater asset to our community than the Belmont Media Center. Um, I can attest to that for the years of uh, the Martin Luther King breakfast that we've had in our community that uh, Jeff has assisted with, multiple community meetings. We have had facilitated discussions and movies at Belmont Media Center. We have co-hosted multiple programs, including ones on housing, uh, ones on voting rights. And with COVID, we really depended on the Belmont Media Center to produce the programs for Belmont Against Racism. And I can also attest as a town meeting member, I can't always attend the select board meetings, but they are online, so I can go ahead and watch them. I can be educated, and I know that other town meeting members do that as well. So thank you very much uh, for everything. Democracy depends on local community media, and we need Belmont Media Center. Thank you. Uh, I see Paul Joy is a virtual point. Uh, Paul, we're promoting you. Can you guys hear me okay? Yes, Paul. Yes. Uh, Paul Joy, town meeting member of Precinct 7, chair of the Economic Development uh, Committee. Um, so last Wednesday night, we had a bit of a technical issue. And within five minutes, Jeff came down to the select board meeting room and he <laughs> solved the problem. And we ultimately had a tremendous and important and great hearing. And, you know, he is just a tremendous asset. Belmont Media is a tremendous asset. We're lucky to have them. Everybody that has already spoken, I completely agree with all those particular comments. And yeah, we we'll just encourage um, us to continue this partnership. Thank you. Thank you, Paul. Um, Joan Horgan is back. I, I'd just like to respectfully ask if we could have the comments that I made earlier about the Belmont Media Center be entered into the record for this hearing. Oh, uh, I think we can we do that? Yeah, I think we can. Okay, we I will do that. Them if it's, yeah. Sure. Yeah. Thank Actually, if you could email them too, that would be helpful. Uh, Ellen, did you want to have a comment? I would love to, thank you. <clears throat> uh, thank you. I want to also add my thanks to Comcast. Please identify I'm sorry, Ellen Shriver. Um, town meeting member precinct eight. I also want to add my thanks to Comcast for helping to um, provide these incredibly important services. I, I particularly want to flag two services that the media center provides that um, people may not think about all the time. One is um, uh, helping to inform the public when there are important issues that will require a public vote. And it is very <coughs> impossible to, to get the word out and to help people think about the questions that are in front of them, particularly with the fact that we don't have a, a newspaper writing about local issues, um, really the media center has stepped in and provided um, a resource that the community has grown to depend on. Um, the other thing I wanted to flag, and I, I have bumped into this on a personal level, is the, the way that Belmont Media is working with students in the high school in order to not, in, in part, to, um, to record and to uh, uh, broadcast events that are happening, but also to work with the students to learn these skills, to learn to uh, film, to uh, commentate, to um, go out and do interviews. So they really add to the curriculum in a way that it isn't in the curriculum. It's, it's um, happening through the Belmont Media Center, um, again. That's personal, but thank you very much. Uh, without in any way taking away from what's already been said and uh, add my appreciation for the Belmont Media Center, do want to recognize that Franklin Tucker is here from the Belmontonian. He does still provide quite a bit of local news and coverage and we're incredibly grateful for, for what he does. So um, yes, Belmont Citizen Herald was a loss, but I highly encourage people to uh, check out the Belmontonian website. And we're also very grateful for people who are working on the Belmont Voice to have Again, some written local coverage. Um, Angus Abercrombie, town meeting member of Precinct 8. I just want to 
uh, joining all of these lovely people and extending my thanks, you know, it is not possible to have a, an active democracy, but also mobilize different kinds of voters and, and, and residents. You know, we see always worryingly low kind of turnout in our municipal elections, but when people can, you know, go online, look at, I mean, there are tremendous archives of public meetings going back for, for years that are made available and we don't have to worry about it when it comes up, when it comes to budget season. And we have to worry about a lot when it comes to budget season in this town. So I really just want to extend my thanks. Yes. I'm uh, Ned Snell. I live at 15 Gorham Road. Uh, my son attends Landmark College in Putney, Vermont. He's a communications major and one day wants to be a movie director. He interned at the Belmont Media Center the last two summers, which was a fantastic experience for him. This past summer, he was able to write, direct, edit, and produce a series of short videos entitled Behind the Scenes in Belmont, focusing on the Underwood Pool, the library, Muzi's, and the Powers Music School. This was a great experience for him as it reinforced the executive function skills needed to accomplish this vision. He also worked behind the scenes, creating video content for other stories and providing editing help where needed. As part of this, he had the experience of being on stage at town meeting, having to sit through the entire thing, all days of it, uh, and in the cold at the high school graduation, which is a little bit colder than I think we all anticipated. And you know, all of this is part of the Belmont Media video crew. These are important real world applications of what he is learning and doing at college. So I'm very much in support of the Belmont Media Center and the impact it has on our community, providing much needed training for students interested in film and video production. And I hope that the select board will work diligently to help Belmont Media Center get the resources they need to continue this mission. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chief DeStefano. Hi, David DeStefano, Fire Chief. I'd like to mention that the Belmont Media Center offers some very tangible results to every person in the town of Belmont uh, in providing us uh, an avenue to um, share public education, share information about the department, share important safety messages uh, through the medium. Uh, Jeff and his staff uh, are absolutely fantastic to work with, very accommodating to professionals. Uh, they allow us to produce uh, and they air uh, a program called Hot Topics uh, that we have on a very regular basis that uh, informs everyone in the town of Belmont and certainly beyond, I would hope, uh, various uh, safety messages from the Belmont Fire Department as well as uh, news and um, new things that are going on within the department. It's a tremendous uh, asset to everyone in the town and I think in a great aid to public safety. Thank you, Chair. May I ask a question of the Cable Tele Television Advisory Committee from me? Perspective of Comcast service, are there any, you know, as we as we enter the, the, the process of renewing this license that's going to expire, um, <clears throat> are there, from a service perspective, any sort of additional comments that you've received? Um, I, I mean, I think... And Mark Carthy... The Media Center is doing great work for us and we love it, you know. Uh, Mark Carthy, Chair of the Cable TV Advisory Committee. No, I think that their service has been pretty good. There's the odd time when somebody will have a question. Okay. I'll just tell you one, one story. In, during COVID, there was a guy who needed to get his service uh, fixed and wouldn't allow anyone into the house, this kind of thing. And so it was very difficult, but, but Comcast came through and really helped out. Okay. Um, so from SeaTac's perspective, nothing from a service perspective needs to be. There's always one or two things, but nothing significant. Okay. All right. Thank you. Great. All right. Any other comments from anybody in the audience live? Let's see, Lisa Bargoli, I see your hand up. Is again, if you if your comment <clears throat> pertains to uh, the Comcast license, we will recognize you. Otherwise, um, you'll have to wait. I don't think I don't believe it does, Mr. Chair. Well, your hand is up. For an opportunity. Um, I I believe I have the right to speak to my government, like to voice my opinion about matters of the government that you're keep muting me and shutting me out. Lisa, we're having a public hearing now. Do you wish to okay, make a statement you know regarding I the public to, hearing? I tried to speak to the first. We have to move on. Okay, thank you. Um, if there are no uh, other uh, public comments, I'd like to recognize Mark Carthy, chair of the Cable TV Advisory Committee for his comments. Okay, good evening again. I'm Mark Carthy, Chair of the Cable TV Advisory Committee, 
And we've already met Jonathan Burge and, and Chet Messer, who are the other two members of the committee. As the chair indicated, we'll be accepting public comments for the hearing record until October 2nd, 2023. And we will seek and accept further comments about cable TV related needs on an ongoing basis. We are working with attorney Bill August, who was introduced earlier uh, on the license renewal process up, to, up until recently, Bill's partner, attorney Peter Epstein advised the town on all the previous cable TV franchises, both Comcast and Verizon since 2005. We're glad Bill was able to step in and take over. Bill, thank you very much for being there. Bill, did you need to say anything at this point? Uh, not at this point, other than just if I could just slip in a personal thanks to uh, the committee and uh, Jeff Hansel, because it, they've been so organized at every twist and turn, and also to the select board and town administrator staff that uh, it's really a, a very organized team, and I appreciate it. That's all I'll say at this time. And Carrie Morris from Comcast also is responsive to to everything, too. So we're, we're moving forward. Things are getting organized. We're getting going. I'll, that's all I'll say at this time. Thank you. I'll just finish up my comments. Mark Carthy, Chair of the Cable TV Advisory Committee. We are also being assisted by Jeff Hansel, who is not only Director of the Belmont Media Center, but has also been a key advisor to SeaTac and the town for 17 years on all of those cable TV franchises as well. Subsequent to this hearing, SeaTac will begin the task of discussing contract terms with Comcast with the aim of presenting a favorable agreement to the select board for review and approval as soon as possible. I think this is important. We're just advisors to the select board. You'll get to make the decision and review the final contract. The public should be aware that SeaTac has gotten favorable terms on all of our previous cable TV franchises, so we are hopeful for a similar result in this case. Now I'd like to ask BMC to make a brief presentation in addition to Jeff Hansel, our Mike Tim, the chair of the BMC Board of Directors, and to give their presentation is Ralph Jones, the treasurer, and the select board appointee to the BMC board. Thank you. Sure. Ralph Jones, precinct three, and also the treasurer of the Belmont Media Center appointed by the select board. Today, the Belmont Media Center submitted a draft report and capital plan to the Cable TV Advisory Committee to be entered into the ascertainment record for the time being. We're gathering information about cable-related needs in the town. We're also discussing plans to relocate the Belmont Media Center from its current location into a town and or school building, uh, possibly the new library and the new high school, middle school. I joined Jeff recently in discussions with the design of the BMC space at the library. And I think I, it was, went very well. I'm very pleased with the uh, success we've had with uh, Kathy Cohane and Peter Strozero, the uh, library director. They were very helpful and accommodating our needs and making sure that there will be a place for cable TV in the, in the library. And I'm sure that the school committee will be equally helpful in locating us there in addition to what we've already done. So we need a little more information to really project, to project our future capital equipment costs because they're gonna be affected by relocation. So the BMC will submit a revised and final report and capital plan to CTAC to be entered into the ascertainment record prior to discussions with Comcast. Jeff prepared a little statement for me here that I think I will you will find informative in terms of giving you a picture of the Belmont Media Center. You may or may not recall that the Belmont Media Center began in 2006 in a small studio in what is now the old high school. For Mark and me, it used to be the new high school, but right, exactly. uh, it now is the old high school. <laughs> Once new, Ralph. Once new, yes. Exactly. Prior to, the, uh, to that, only the select board hearings were cable cast and other attempts were made to cable cast some committee meetings and town meetings. For about a year, Julie and Jeff worked seven days a week in the studio to keep BMC programs on the air until a video server was added in 2007. Today, 2023, BMC programs four Access TV channels 24 seven. 
and much of the production, editing, training, and programming is carried out remotely or on location. And while the staff no longer have to work seven days a week, a week in the studio, BMC staffers are often on the job early in the morning, late at night, in the school, and whatever the town needs dictate. Just to give you some idea of the numbers here, with a staff of four full-time and two part-time employees, plus interns and successful volunteers, BMC accomplished the following in the last fiscal year. 200 or more public meetings, including town meeting, BHS graduation, and as was mentioned earlier, the Martin Luther King Day breakfast and others. 400 plus public events, studio and remote programs, 68 episodes of COVID-19 updates run by the Public Health Department, 2,000 hours of local and regional programming and live TV coverage, 40 to 50 production and editing volunteers over the course of the year, and 22 customized training sessions. I think what was mentioned earlier about the success that young people have had getting to learn television, video, and editing goes a long way in terms of the help we're giving to the community. In terms of the COVID response, which is very important, when COVID epidemic hit, BMC quickly shifted its entire operation to assist the town, the schools, and local groups, and the community at large to stay connected and informed. We work closely with the town and school staff to implement remote meeting technology in a variety of ways. We built and managed three hybrid meeting system, systems for the town and school department. We helped to organize and convene the first remote town meeting. And this fall, we'll coordinate a hybrid town meeting at the new middle high school. We built and helped manage a hybrid meeting system for Belmont Light. BMC shares a part-time employee, Rick Berger, with the Beach Street Center, who coordinates TV coverage, hybrid meetings and events, and produces Talking News, a news program featuring volunteers for the visually impaired. We are currently working with the Council on Aging to expand hybrid programming at the Beach Street Center. Our staff is working to outfit the new TV studio and podcast studio at the new middle and high school. And we are currently overseeing teacher student training and production at the TV studio at the Chenery Upper Middle Upper Elementary School, a studio which we designed, helped to fund, and installed in 2017. Today's challenges. At the same time that the Belmont Media Center has expanded our outreach and services, particularly in the COVID response, franchise revenue fees began to decrease, although not as much as in other towns, and we appreciate that. BMC responded by cutting expenses, making operations more efficient, delaying equipment purchases, increasing volunteer involvement, increasing other sources of revenue, and working to pass a state streamlining bill, which the select board supports to replace lost franchise revenue. And as mentioned earlier, we are seriously discussing relocating the Belmont Media Center into a town or school building, which will reduce fixed expenses of rent. It also will provide some room to afford, afford absorb further decreases in cable TV franchise revenue if it occurs and allow BMC to continue to operate in the future. Thank you. Well, that's great. I mean, I think that's a lot of applause done for us. Can I ask a question about this, the bill that was uh, that we supported? Has that passed into law? Or? I'm sorry? For the additional franchise, for the additional fees, it was we, we had supported and sent a letter on um, on streaming, I believe. Has that bill passed? Um, that's that is in process now. I mean that's <clears throat> I'm sorry, I'm have new hearing aids, so I'm not actually hearing. That's that. okay. But Ralph read for reference um, yeah. the bill that that we as a board right. sent a letter in support of. Has that bill been passed into law by That's, the state legislature? I have to defer to Jeff. Take, uh, several months. What we're doing is there's a legislative committee, and it's uh, it will be taken up in February. So, okay. Is our state legislators in support of this bill? Do we know? Okay. Thank you. And I have, I just have a brief video uh, uh, about three minutes. 
just further testimonials. We have time for that. Fire chief again. No, no. I'm David DiStefano, chief of the Belmont Fire Department. And I'd like to say that the Belmont Media Center is an invaluable tool in helping us get out our message of fire safety and public education. They provide a platform for us for a uh, hot topics uh, video show in which we're able to um, broadcast various um, initiatives within the department as well as uh, educational and um, public awareness pieces. And we really couldn't do this important work without the help of Belmont Media Center. I'm Chris Benoit, owner of the Spirited Gourmet, and I'd like to ask the select board to get the best franchise with Comcast to ensure continued funding for the Belmont Media Center. Belmont Media Center provides a valuable service to Belmont businesses in getting our messages out to residents and helps promote local businesses. Thank you. Hi, I'm Bob Lasseter. I don't live in Belmont. My family does, especially my grandkids who attend Belmont High. For the last three years, I have greatly appreciated the work that Belmont Media Center has done to cablecast BHS Sports Live and to make those live streams and on-demand games available to families and friends of our BHS students who live outside of Belmont, and in my case, way out of state. It has meant a lot and especially during the pandemic, to be able to watch my grandkids compete for Belmont High, even though I could not be there in person. I have literally watched my grandkids grow up on live TV, and that would not have been possible without Belmont Media Center. The entire Lasseter family supports BMC, and I ask the select board to make the best deal you can with Comcast so that BMC keeps receiving franchise fees and can continue to operate. Thank you. Hi, I'm Tommy Olson of 10 Bay State Road. I'm the producer and founder of the Payson Park Music Festival. Belmont Media has been very helpful in cable casting and live streaming our concerts. They provided the technical and production assistance to our organization that was not available anywhere else. We will be counting on their help in the future. Therefore, I asked the select board to negotiate the license renewal fee with Comcast so that BMC will receive the maximum amount of franchise revenue possible. Thank you very much. Hi, I'm Eric Powell, and I live at 50 White Street in Belmont. I've been a resident for 60 plus years, and I own my business in Belmont for 40 plus years but I'm also a friend and supporter of Belmont Media Center, BMC. They provide a unique service for our community with their local TV coverage of local high school sports and community events, and their assistance in promoting Belmont businesses. But I also value how BMC reaches out to all parts of our community and tries to get everybody involved. I respectfully ask the Belmont Select Board to make sure that BMC gets continued funding from the next cable contract with Comcast. Thank you. Um, um, um. Somebody. All right. Um, Mark, any other comments from the committee? No, thank you very much for taking the time. So I think what we need to do now is leave the ascertainment process open for another 14 days, Jeff, and then um, we'll, we'll gather the comments so that we'll know what to input into the process with Comcast. Great. So uh, <clears throat> the purpose of this public hearing is to uh, gather public comments only. The select board is not taking any action, but I didn't want to state uh, in response to at least some of the videos that the select board is always committed to obtaining the best deal possible in <laughs> any contract. <laughs> In that perspective, what is the timing of this, Mark? 
we will we will finish the ascertainment process. Then we will work with the bill August to put together a draft contract. Um, we usually will outline the general terms, possibly for the town manager, just to have a quick look at before we would send it over to Comcast. It's up to them on their timing. We we had some difficulty with Verizon. They took a long time. Comcast is supposed to be quicker. That's what we've heard. But we we, we await their response. And, and fortunately, with Bill August, who is also negotiating similar contracts for other towns, we have an idea of the type of contract that they're approving at the moment, and that's the way we work. Okay. Thank you for that. All right. Well, this is all very helpful. Thank you all for... I, know, I just yeah. need to close the CTEC meeting as oh, well. Yeah. So um, I'm just uh, call on uh, Chet Messer and Jonathan Burge just to close the CTEC meeting. If you could just speak up, if they can. Jonathan Burge, aye. Chet, if you're still there, he may be just gone. I think we have two is enough to close it. Thank you very much. Well, obviously, that's all we have. Yeah. Thank you for coming. Appreciate right. that. Thank yeah. you for your comments, Robert. Well, and I will declare the public hearing for Comcast over for this evening, and thank you all for participating. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Good night, everyone. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. It's up to you, Mr. Chair. Who, who besides that? Well, the Allison. Oh, yes. All oh, yeah. oh, right. Yeah. And then, then. That makes sense. Yeah. Okay. All right, uh, everybody. Given the, um, I should say. Thank you all for your comments. Have a good evening. Given, given the not unexpected. Um, so wait a second for the room to empty. Uh, given the not uh, unexpected um, failure to adhere to our schedule, I'd like to, before <laughs> uh, returning to Jennifer's presentation on the uh, high school debt, uh, acknowledge two residents who are here for other reasons because uh, we don't want to uh, impose on their time any more than necessary. Uh, the first is Dante Mazzioli, who, um, actually, Dante, if you want to come to the table. And so you can can we also invite camera. Ellen Schreiber here, who's on the agenda, as invited as Representative Francis Joy's Park. Good evening, everybody. You were listed on the agenda as invited. Um, at least hmm. I saw mine. Okay. So the, uh, if people may not, well, I hope people have noticed the huge amount of work that was done at Joey's Park. Uh, that was completed recently. Uh, that work was actually done by Dante and his firm, and Dante can provide uh, some additional details on how that came about. But what I, what I wanted to say uh, before Dante describes what they did there is that um, there probably was a time when everybody in Belmont knew Dante. Maybe that's not as true today because we're all getting a little older. But um, Dante is just, he's at this point just a tremendous person who has stepped up to more things than you can count. Uh, he'll describe his work on Joey's Park, but he's done so many other things. If you wonder why Belmont Center looks so clean on a summer morning, it's because Dante was there at four or five in the morning doing the work. If you wonder why the cemetery looks so good on Memorial Day, it's because Memor uh, Dante, if you didn't know, runs a landscaping business that's very well established in Belmont. He brings an entire crew down to uh, take care of the, the cemetery so it looks its best. And there's just a million other ways in which he contributes to uh, just the social fabric of the town in, in ways that aren't always recognized. But we did want to recognize him particularly here tonight for the very enormous job they did at Joey's Park. And it's something that uh, it's the first it's the first big rehab of the park since the work was done around 10 years ago. And uh, hopefully what he's done there will last for another 10 years. But uh, Dante, if, if the camera could turn to you for a second so people can see who you are, and then if you could just speak for a moment about uh, what you did there, I think we'd all like to hear. Well, uh, thank you, Mr. Chair, members of the committee of the town. Uh, uh, the, the park is, is not only we put some time into it in, in recent weeks, but uh, it came from thousands and thousands of residents who over the years, one is sitting right next to me, Ellen, 
um, we put a lot of time into uh, into the park, and uh, that's not the first park we did. It started in '89, and we transformed another one. Into, I think 2003, and uh, it just was a little tired looking. Uh, it, it's there to me. Uh, my, my three adult children were, were, were grew up there, and uh, I was involved with building the first two parks as a as a uh, parent of. Uh, young children and uh and the, the town has been my uh, home for all my life I'm, and i'm blessed for that and i'm lucky but uh what belmont has uh and, and always has has had a large group of people like yourselves who go over and above caring for this town and uh i'm, I'm just uh one of uh many and able to participate in uh doing a lot of nice things for a town that is has served my not only myself and my my family, but a lot of friends and a lot of close friends. Well, uh, so I I feel that I am uh, blessed to be involved with this whole community. So uh, my little piece of giving back to the community is, is something that I, uh, I I personally enjoy. It's probably one of the, one of the more pleasant moments in my day um, doing that. So we the, the park got a little tired. Uh, we, we did a lot of we did a lot of different work to it, and uh, we did a lot of uh, a lot of maintenance that needed to be done. We made some repairs. Uh, we uh, sanded and painted. Uh, uh, everything has been uh, updated and just just brought up the way it was uh, years ago. And uh, we're very proud of the way it looks. And I, I will say too, we had a lot of a great help by the town people, not only by the. Uh, uh, town administrator, uh, Jay Marquardt, uh, Mike Santoro, Frank Santoro have been very, uh, very, very helpful for us to make it a successful project. When we started, I, when I met with Ellen um, several weeks before we started, we we had a very aggressive schedule and uh, we found ourselves working there Saturday and Sunday till late in the evening trying to get this project done um, and, and it came up. But it, it it's not, it, it, it's just of a uh, example of when you know you love something and you love the town you want to give it back and this, this town is made of so many of those people and i'm uh, again uh, i'm thrilled to be able to participate in the process thank you I'd like to add my my thanks to roy uh i i've had some fun field trips with dante who keeps his eyes and ears open and really really notices what goes on with the town and i'm just really grateful for the love and the care and the passion that he puts into it. I know I sound like a broken record, but Belmont really heavily depends on the volunteer time and money and efforts of its, its many, many private citizens. And so I want to thank Dante. I also want to thank Ellen, who's here, who uh, with Friends of Joyce Park, certainly did a lot with the first rehab and has helped to facilitate some of the financing around this, this latest update and um, add to what Dante said about DPW and our, our really dedicated town staff employees. Um, who, who all work together to make this happen. So Dante, glad you're here tonight. And, and again, thanks. Thank you. Let me just add, I mean, Dante, thank you for your kind words and your contributions as Roy indicated, as the chair indicated. Uh, and the park looks absolutely beautiful. And the work that you've done, it's, it's, it's Dante Mozzioli done in the right way um, to sort of continue to add to the quality of life of our kids and residents within that community. Uh, I'm so grateful for your contributions and your commitment to our town. So thank you for that. And Ellen, thank you for your continued leadership as it relates to Joey's Park. And and also Joe O'Donnell, I think, has some, you know, some input here as well. He's no longer a resident, I believe, but it, initially the park was before his son in memory of his son. And so I know he continues to have so a deep affection and love for that. And I think it's, it's shared by both you and Ellen. So thank you, Dante. Park, it looks absolutely beautiful. It was tired and still being used by a lot of kids. And uh, when I went down to the day that I told you I went down there, the park was full and some of the some of the kids were saying, oh, this is fixed now. So that was kind of a special moment for me when I heard one of uh, this little young child say, oh, this is now fixed now, mom and dad. And I thought about, you know, the work that you and your associates have done. So thank you, Dante. Well, Joe, Joe O'Donnell, uh, uh, in his, uh, he, he lost his uh, young son, and I, I am personal friends with him. And uh, so uh, the park does it, but how gratifying for anybody who lives in this town to go by on Cross Street and just sit there and, and just look at all the kids, uh, 
you know, I'd like to see them pick up a few more papers when they finish their candy wrappers. <laughs> For the most part, uh, it, it's filled with kids and families and things like that. It, it, it's a special spot. So, and it, I know it's very, very dear to the O'Donnell family, as it is to me. Well, uh, we can't give you a plaque or we don't have a plaque to give you. Oh, we can shake your hand. But we Thank can you. Can I, can I just add one thing? Sure. I'm here. Dante did this work and it was an amazing thing and he brought it to um, everyone's attention. He kicked this thing off. Um, Joey's Park's 10th anniversary is this October. Mm -hmm. uh, we will have a celebration on October. Oh, that's great to hear. Um, but I want to thank Dante on behalf of all the families who used the park, many of whom weren't even here when we did the rebuild 10 years ago. And it's beautiful and people have recognized it and personally and on behalf of all those people, I wanna say thank you. Well, it's an example of, um, in its own way, it's a public private partnership on this micro level and it's, it's just had tremendous benefits for everybody. So uh, Dante, it's been great. Thank you, Dante. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> We can count on Franklin for uh, a. We should take a photograph. Sorry, we should have, have a photograph here because. Uh, uh, well, this is this is like highlighted. Yeah. Here, actually, let's let Dante yeah. get in the middle. Franklin's like the photographer of record. <laughs> yeah, he is. And he's a good one. <laughs> That's right. 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 All those hockey trophies who won, Doctor. Yeah, right. <laughs> Thank you for having us. Thank you, Doctor. Thanks, guys. Thanks. Okay. I think they do a funny. This has to be a new planner. Oh, we can do that. So I'd like to turn actually to another uh, great benefactor in Belmont is is. Liz Allison, and I see she, she's here with her husband, Graham. If you can come to the table so you can be on camera. Oh. It, this is something that actually does require select board action because we are accepting yet another generous contribution from the Allison family, this time uh, for a service dog for the police department. And uh, it's something that I, I didn't know actually existed, but Liz and Graham have been extremely mindful of the police department for many years among their many um, charitable contributions to the town. And Liz, if you could take a moment to explain what, what the dog is all about, I think that would be very helpful. Uh, Liz Allison, uh, town meeting member, precinct three. Uh, the the dog is a uh, lab that will, uh, it, it's not a canine, it doesn't go out on patrol. The lab is, is job is to stay in the uh, police department and to create a more, uh, a less stressful and more welcoming environment. Uh, it is something that in this area, the Marion Ryan, the district attorney, began the trend and it is something that police departments all over are beginning to adopt. Generally, it is the lab often regarded as the world's most best all round dog who is ideal for this service. Terrific. So I had never heard of this before we received um, information about this really wonderful donation. And uh, I just, I think it's a great idea. Um, I have a son with autism and we had a dog for whom that was life changing. Yeah. And so I've seen how a dog can really, really improve um, stressful situations, mental health situations. And so even though I've never heard of it, I'm, I'm thrilled that, that we're doing it. And, and, and thank you, not just for this, but um, uh, you both, and especially Liz, has donated so much time. You don't just give, give money to the town. You give your time and your, your love and your passion and your energy and creativity. So this is really great. Thank you. Just to be clear, the idea was not ours. The idea is Chief McIsaacs uh, is always looking to see how he can improve and advance the police department. And since the chief has joined us on Zoom, I wondered if you'd like to uh, speak for a little bit about uh, where the dog will reside in the police department and what role you see for the dog. 
Sure. Well, thank you for having me, please, Chief James McIsaac, and thank you, Liz and Graham Allison, for the the donation. It's you know it's remarkable. Um, what what uh, what what is you know as I interact with other chiefs and I, I you know Marion Ryan was the first uh, comfort dog that I saw that that you know police agency or prosecution prosecutor you know had, and other chiefs uh, Redding, uh, Maynard, Tewksbury, they all were talking you know praising this program and at the same time one of our officers had come up to me and said um, hey would you ever think of getting a comfort dog I'd be interested in being a, a handler for one. So I, I did some research, we put together a proposal and um, I presented it to, to, to Liz and Graham and, and they fully supported it. The dog will uh, venture outside of the police station at times, you know, Beach Street Center. It's a, our goals are mostly to create a bond within the Belmont police community, uh, improve our public police relations, um, comfort the community during times of high stress and so, um, you know, people have talked, there's been a number of times when we've had uh, young people or people in stress at the station for, for hours, and it would be very beneficial to, um, you know, have the comfort dog uh, present during those times. And so we're, we're excited about it. Uh, we'll be getting the dog in December. And um, we, we have, uh, thank you to the Allisons, we have enough funds to, to fund the program for, for more than one year. So it'll, it'll be, we're really looking forward to it. And we think it's gonna be a great addition to the department. Fabulous. Uh, well, I just wanna comment as well and thank uh, both Liz and Graham uh, for their ongoing contributions to our community and for the contribution of this comfort or service dog to the police department. It is the first I've heard of it as well, Liz. Uh, so I was fascinated by what I read about, you know, the role that this dog will play within our police department. I think it's a wonderful idea. So thank you for your generosity, both of you. Appreciate it. Well, we thank you all for taking your time and the investment of the people in the town, in the town is a big deal. Well, Graham, thank you for that. I know how, you know, how active you are, you know, serving um, not only our community, but also the country. So we appreciate that. Thank you from you too. That, okay, uh, wonderful. We have um, a, a motion for this. So I move to accept a donation of $9,525 from Elizabeth and Graham Allison for the purchase and training of a service dog for the Belmont Police Department. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thanks again. Thank, Thank you both. You. Thank you. Thank you. Graham, great to see you Thank as well. You. Take care. All the best. Thank you, Chief. Chief wants to do the reorganization. Uh, well, people that need to leave. I think our town planner, yeah. planner has to leave here. Okay. Uh, and still in the spirit of um, respecting people's time, before turning back to Jennifer, um, we're going to uh, go back to our 7.05 p.m. item of reorganization of the Office of Community Development to the Office of Planning and Building because we have a number of department heads here who uh, have had a long deal. <laughs> Chase is going to take the lead. Please. Chair Glenn Clancy, town engineer, I'm here this evening to uh, talk about a couple of different things. The first one, and I think the most important, is to introduce our new town planner, uh, this is Christopher Ryan. Um, welcome. <laughs> welcome to I'm that. Italian. I was actually just gesturing. I wasn't. <laughs> uh, worked out well. It did. It did. Um, Chris has been hired as the town planner. There's also been a restructuring of the Office of Community Development, which I'll speak to in a minute. Um, Chris's formal title is the director of the Office of Planning and Building, and he's also the town planner. Um, Chris has a previous engagement this evening that we didn't think was gonna be an issue at, with the 705 agenda topic. So what I would like to suggest, if it's okay with the board, is that you maybe you perhaps have your introductions and maybe, you know, you know your well wishes, and then we could dismiss Chris, and then I can talk about community development if that's okay. Uh, Chris, welcome. Uh, I was not able to attend your, your introductory coffee. I desperately wanted to be there because uh, it is not an overstatement to say that you are a central piece to the town's future. Um, we are in desperate need of some forward uh, thinking regarding our zoning bylaw. Um, and how we're going to uh, write the town's finances in particular, trying to be more, more friendly to business and appropriate commercial development. And 
So um, I trust Patrice's judgment, and she was extremely enthusiastic when she said that she found you. I looked at your resume. You have lots of relevant experience. Um, excited to have you as a, a visionary and capable member of our both our finance team and our planning team. Um, I think you'll be working closely and already have with the planning board, zoning board of appeals, economic development committee, and the Vision 21 implementation committee. But um, I'm really pleased at the personnel we have and that we've added those committees. And I think you were you were the missing piece. So not to make you feel daunted, but welcome and let's get to work. <laughs> Thank you so much. I'm, I'm so happy, so pleased to be here. There's some fantastic projects to work on. And I'm I'm hoping to add the kind of innovative thinking that you're, you're putting on me. I think I can do it. Uh, I think I'm ready for the task and uh, I'm, I'm ready to hit the ground running. And we're here to help. Great. Well, welcome to the team, Chris, and uh, your resume is very impressive. Town of Duxbury, Town of Harvest, City of Lemonster, Metropolitan Area Planning Council, Benton County Government, Town of a uh, Aver Ayer. Uh, so incredible experience. I was really impressed when I was reading through my binder last night. Thank you. Your extensive uh, resume and the experience that you have. I know you bring a lot of value to our community, so we welcome, welcome to the team. Look forward to working with you. Appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank you so much. Yeah, Chris and I have already started working quite intensively. I, I'm oh. just reminded of Casablanca when they said, we're, we're going to make beautiful music. <laughs> <laughs> right. and, and some beautiful buildings and a beautiful community. <laughs> Absolutely. Sorry for a delay and hopefully we can make you late for it. Whatever. No, I just I just made a, a commitment with my son and oh, that's uh, he's in town. So that's, that's I just sure. wanted to make sure that he wasn't uh, sitting in some lonely bar by himself like Casablanca. <laughs> <laughs> But anyway, well, let, let us not detain you any further, Glenn, unless there's anything else we need to come Thanks so to. much. Thank you, Chris. All the best. Have, have a great night. Thanks, Chris. Thank you. See you in the morning. So, Mr. Chair, yes. um, first, let me state that, as I've, I've said this to a couple of people already, if you were to call Central Casting and request a municipal planner, he's the guy they sent. I mean, when, when Patrice and I interviewed him, um, we saw his resume and his credentials. We were just so thrilled. Um, we suffered for a long time without a planner. And uh, I think we understood ultimately what the reason was behind that, which is going to dovetail into what I'm about to explain to the board. Um, the Office of Community Development in the last year or so has been hit hard with vacancies and, and positions across the spectrum from administrative all the way up to the town planner. Um, as we are all aware, the town, the um, the job market is not what it used to be. Uh, there aren't a lot of people out there actively looking for work. We would advertise positions, uh, and it was not uncommon for us to get no applicants. It also was not uncommon for us to get applicants who weren't qualified for the position that we were advertising. Um, it was very difficult to. Uh, backfill the vacant positions in the department. I spent a lot of time looking at positions, once again, from administrative all the way up through inspectors and beyond, trying to figure out how to you know, reconstitute some of these pieces, fit them together to make sure that we are in, in a position to provide the services that we're required to provide and also find capable people to fill those positions. Um, the one p position that we couldn't fill was the town planner. Um, and as this went on, and as Patrice and I would talk about the fact that we were having such difficulty doing this, you know, something occurred to me. And what occurred to me was, you know, the two probably most critical positions in that department are the director and the assistant director. And they are the most critical because they are the positions that really span across the spectrum of um, work that the department does. As the director of community development, I was the inspector of buildings. I was the code zoning enforcement officer. I was the town engineer. Ari Ugertian, as the assistant director, does everything. I mean, he, he does field engineering for us. He does zoning board, planning board work. He does building inspector work. He supervises the local building inspector. I've looked at those two positions and I said, how are we ever going to fill these two positions should they become vacant? And I didn't have a good answer for that. And so I started thinking about what this department looks like three, four, five years down the road and what could potentially happen if I decide to finally hang it up, if Ira decides he wants to hang it up. And so um, started giving that some thought. I came to two conclusions. The first conclusion was that we could let it ride. 
that Ara and I could continue on doing what we're doing. Um, Ara has expressed no interest in, in leaving anytime soon. I don't have any plans to leave anytime soon. So one of the options was let it ride. We'll keep plugging away, trying to find a town planner, um, hopefully find someone, fill that position, and then just move on. And when the day comes, if I finally decide that I want to retire or, or leave the town of Belmont, I'll give my notice. And then Patrice, uh, with the town administrator who may be there at the time down the road, they'll be left to deal with the issue of trying to fill the position. Um, when I became the director of community development, I had my credentials as an inspector of buildings. I had the engineering background required to become the town engineer. I, I, I could slide into that position very easily. That was 20 years ago. There's no one behind me. Okay, so there's nobody in house that's going to slide in behind me. And then further, I don't think we're gonna find anybody out there in the world that's gonna come in and take the job of an inspector of buildings and a town engineer. I just don't see it being practical. So option one, let it ride, and then someone could deal with this down the road. The second option was to stop thinking about a succession plan and think about what, what we could do to make this more sensible and more reasonable moving forward. So I went to Patrice, I explained the dilemma. I told her how I saw the two options. Um, we had a nice long conversation about it and we both agreed that what was in the best interest of the town was to come up with a succession plan and to reconstitute the Office of Community Development into something that was sensible and recognizable for the public. And so that's what we did. Um, so the first thing that we tackled was the Office of Planning and Building. We thought that we thought, you know, from based on my research and based on Patrice's experience, we felt that that was those were two departments that made sense together. Um, in the process of us looking at that structure, it occurred to us that if we create a building division, if we have a planner as the director over the building division. We've now taken what is ordinarily just a staff planner or a, a town planner position, and we've now made that a director position. We, so we've created a director level position, uh, the director of the Office of Planning and Building, which we thought would make that position more attractive in the job market. And sure enough, it wasn't too long after that that Christopher applied and we landed him. So we felt really good about our instincts on how all of that played out. Um, we brought Kelly in from HR at one point to work out all the details with job descriptions and the hiring of all of that. That piece um, has come together nicely. So the next task for us um, was to look at the engineering division. Um, I am going to retain my role as the town engineer. Uh, the challenge that we have now is to build an engineering division. So Patrice and I brought in Jay Marcotte because the logical place to put an engineering division is in the Department of Public Works. Um, if you look at most communities, that's where it lives. That's where it should live in Belmont. It's been one of the things for the 20 years I've run this department that has always troubled me was this confusion that you would get from people from time to time when you would when they look at you and go, wait a minute, you're the inspector of buildings and the town engineer? How come your engineering division isn't in the public works department? Well, because we do things a little differently here in Belmont, right? And so, you know, after 20 years of that, you finally come to realize, you know, there is a real, there is a sensible way to do this. What, you know, when, when do you get the opportunity to do that? That opportunity is now. Um, and so we continue to talk about uh, what that engineering division should be because you know, we touched on one of the uh, topics earlier tonight, the MS4 permitting, the stormwater issues that the town of Belmont is facing and are going to continue to be issues. Um, so Jay and I and Patrice, we're continuing to talk about that engineering division. Um, in parallel with that, we're meeting with Jennifer and her finance team to talk about the budget because we need to put budgets together for the new Office of Planning and Building and then the Engineering Division under DPW for FY25. Could you, um, if you mind, Mr. Chair, I mean, this is all great, Glenn. I think we have an org chart that perhaps might make sense to show the residents. And uh, one of the questions I had, Glenn, is are, are all these positions filled or we need to fill them? I guess that's a question I have for at least for the Planning and Building Division that Mr. Ryan will be um, the director of, correct? Planning and building uh, division is entirely staffed. So Ari Agurtian is now the inspector of buildings. Um, all of the other positions that are in the org chart. Uh, director of town planner, of course, is Chris. Uh, the inspector of buildings is Ara. Um, all of the other positions that are on the, uh, that diagram are filled. So community development, the chain, that will be a change in the name of that department? That's right. 
Yeah, community development will no longer exist. So the, the engineering function uh, is completely moved to DPW in this plan? That's correct. It'll become a division, like the water division, engineering division. Okay. Um, is that where um, the stormwater bylaw enforcement takes place within build, planning and buildings or? Under, no, it's engineering. Under the engineering, so you assume the responsibility. That's correct. So assume that responsibility. That's correct. And, and we, are, we are pretty well committed to bringing a position in to be a stormwater coordinator. There may be other duties that go along with that, um, but the way that the, the way that the stormwater and the MS fourth stuff is just exploding, we well, it's we complicated need, and it is it's exploding. We need a we need a dedicated person for that. In, in terms of uh, um, um, pavement, uh, roadway pavement, and and and, and, and that, that's still a thunder engineer as well. Absolutely. Yep. I, I, I'll retain that. That's so, Glenn, Glenn, what would be the as of date for these changes? So the Office of Planning and Building is is done. I mean, that that um, September fifth is when Chris started, and that is the date that we consider that de that department to have uh, you know had its inception on September fifth. There's still some legwork we need to do. Well, I would think from a budget perspective, we need to understand you know because you need to craft a budget that's now we have split responsibilities, right? We, yeah, so we're leaving the 24 budget as is. It's just complicated. To no, change. I think that makes um, sense. We're going to be reflecting all the changes in FY25. That makes sense. Um, there are some yeah. bylaw and zoning um, changes we need to make um, right. that refer to Office of Community Development, which we'll clean up in the spring. Right. So things like that are going to be kind of ongoing. Uh, and so the liaison to the planning board, Zone Board of Appeals, will be from this uh, new Office of Planning and building. That's correct. Okay. Right. So the, the way it's been structured, Elizabeth, is um, ARA as the inspector of buildings and the zoning enforcement officer um, as designated by the zoning bylaw. Yep. ARA will handle special permitting applications for the planning board um, and uh, ultimately the zoning board. Um, right now, the zoning board work is being done by the staff planner. Uh, what we see over the next year is that that, that role of that work would actually shift to ARA as the inspector of buildings. Site plan approvals would be Chris. Chris would deal with site plan approval with the planning board. And then also, of course, any work with the planning board related to drafting new zoning bylaws, you know, th things more on the regulatory level, Chris would, would be the uh, staff liaison to the planning board for that. This is looking into the future and hoping for a successful override. You and I have spoken about this and the difficulty of businesses uh, just because of the complexity of our very cobbled together zoning by lot is not a reflection on any staff in the town. But the difficulty that we've had in giving businesses guidance on how to get from A to Z, is there a role for uh, someone in this new department to be a liaison with businesses in the community? So I'm going to preface. Existing or, or, or new? Sure. I'm going to preface this by saying that this is no longer my department to speak. I, I, and I realize that as I'm um, asking the question. But if you, if you want my two cents as yeah. someone who has some experience. As someone who has run it. <laughs> <laughs> um, what I, what, the way I would approach this, and, that way, and we've had preliminary conversations with Chris about this, the way that I would approach this is once I can get the zoning board um, liaison work off of the staff planner's desk, and, into, and onto the inspector of buildings. That is a, a pretty significant task that would be taken off of the staff planner's plate. At that point, I think uh, if I were running the show, I would evaluate whether or not that creates an opportunity for an economic development you know, person, you know, or an economic development tasks, I guess. Portfolio. Yeah. Um, yeah. To, to be handed to the staff planner. Okay. Um, but I feel like I've said too much. I, I think that it's going to be Chris's call ultimately. It's going to be a discussion. But I, but I do see an opportunity there um, if it plays out the way I think it is. Um, I think it will. So uh, can I just say uh, I really appreciate your thoughtfulness in approaching this, that when you and Patrice brought me in to discuss this, it made all kinds of sense. And as you say, I think the proof's in the pudding, the fact that we were not able to fill this, the position of the town planner and then finally we were. It just, I think it became a much more attractive position for someone who's highly capable and visionary. So I, uh, frankly, it takes uh, an amount of humility to be willing to do that and, um, you know, good goodwill toward the town. So thank you. Glenn, can I ask you who would, have, who would have ongoing responsibility with the Community Path Project? Pardon me? Who would have, who's gonna assume the response, 
you, you'll continue to be saying that absolutely. Yeah, I don't think so. Yeah, Mark, well, that's in design. That is clearly an engineering. That's an engineering aspect of that. Yeah. No question. Is it true? That was another factor in all of all of the consideration here is when you look mm -hmm. on the horizon and you see a capping of a landfill. You see two phases of a community path. You see what's happening with stormwater. You see what's happening with traffic issues. The engineering division is really getting, um, it's, it, the, the, the demands on that division are growing. And to keep this current structure of myself sharing my time as an inspector of buildings, as a town engineer, it was, it was getting too difficult to cover all the bases effectively. <coughs> so there's another reason why it was time to do this. Um, I agree with that. In, but in terms of the um, engineering division, is that fully staffed? No, uh, no. no. We have. We, we, we need to fill there. Starting to sketch out. We've got. We've got an idea well, of the. We have, this. We have the town engineer in front of us, but yeah. <laughs> we have, we, have, we're, we so we've sketched out what we think it's going to look like. Um, this is still somewhat fluid. Um, resident engineer is the immediate need. Um, so I think we're on the verge of filling that position. The stop coordinator, the street opening permit coordinator is a position that exists already in DPW. And because of that position's role in permitting um, excavations and pavement restoration, that's an obvious position to move to the engineering division. Um, so that position is staffed and that's just, that would be just a rejiggering of budget. Um, the assistant town engineer slash stormwater coordinator, that's the position that Jay and I and Patrice have talked about that we think uh, makes sense, not only in terms of having a position to deal with stormwater, but also someone who could act as my assistant and, and, and maybe even be a successor to myself as the town engineer down the road. Um, so a little bit of succession planning within su succession planning with that in mind. So presumably those positions will be considered as part of the 25 budget? Yes. Right. So Glenn, I have two questions about this. Uh, one is a, d a detail, a conservation agent, is, is currently full-time and going to part-time? So the conservation agent is a part-time position. Always. In the initial structure here, we had identified it as a permitting function and therefore left it in the Office of Planning and Building. Okay. Um, we've been reconsidering that, thinking that, again, for succession planning purposes, when the current, uh, when the current conservation agent decides to move on, what we're thinking actually is that the Conservation Commission support and, and that role as an agent can be folded into the assistant town engineer stormwater coordinator position. Okay. Um, I think there's capacity within that position for them to do that, for that person to do that. And then it, it sounds like uh, taking together, there's a slight headcount increase in doing all of this. I imagine there would be since there's, there's uh, two positions here, right? Three. The, the only additional position is the assistant town engineer slash stormwater coordinator. What about the resident engineer? I thought resident you engineer. Well, that position was cut in 21, but that's work that Ira has been doing, which he can't continue to do. And so we need to fill that position. We need to right. fill that right. position because, I, you know, I got a little spiteful and I'm going to publicly apologize to my town administrator for this because when, when, uh, when we were having conversations about the necessity of having our full-time resident engineer back, I said, okay, I'll show her. And I started following her the emails that we get from the residents on these roads that we're fixing. I think she finally came around to the idea that we need to have a presence on these streets when, uh, when they're under construction, and we do. Um, and so this is a way to address that. Because um, I was spread too thin. And, and again, as I was shifts permanently to be the inspector of buildings, he's not gonna have the ability to be a resident engineer anymore. I, I have said it before, I will say it again. We are severely understaffed yes. in DPW and what used to be Office of Community Development is now Office of Building and we're planning and building. We, we are understaffed on the town side. We have done this to support the schools and I understand why we did it, but we have cut and cut and cut to the bone. There is no fat to be cut in town hall right now. Yeah, I think the challenge too is we're understaffed, but we also are looking ahead at potential, you know, vacancies to positions for longtime employees that hold an enormous amount of historical knowledge. Of yes, I, I so completely agree. Succession planning really, it's twofold. It, it's really to get people in to learn a lot from the people that are already here and that will be moving on eventually. I support that completely. Yeah. It's really hard to do succession planning. Not, not a lot of people do it successfully, so yeah. I think it's- This has been a solid plan and I'm really happy with the succession plan. Jay, do you want to make a comment? I was just, I texted Patrice this oh. morning, <laughs> and Eric, 
I, I, I think these positions, um, I know that the 25 budget is going to clearly be, um, we're going to debate and deliberate on that and clearly creates a challenge, but I agree with Elizabeth. I think, you know, the office, of, what was now, what was the Office of Community Development, and we can speak to all the departments, frankly, but I'll speak to OCD for a moment, um, has, in my mind, always been since I've been on the board, understaffed, and I think I strongly support adding the positions we need to add under the town engineer division. I think we all do, but I guess my my next question is going to be space. Uh, can this all be done within the Homer building or with something like the module? So this is, CPU? go ahead, Patrice. Go ahead. So there, there, we have some restructures going on kind of all over the place. So once um, we get past April, my plan is to kind of sit everyone down and try and map out a, a space plan that suits everyone. Um, I do think we have the space. We just have to be smart about how we, what people are. Um, okay. So yeah, that will be coming in the spring. Mr. Chair, I will avoid going down that rabbit hole <laughs> and asking a whole bunch of space questions, which just got triggered. That's a fair point, actually. <laughs> no, it just as long as no, it's, 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 a, it's a good question, and all of a sudden, no, I got a whole lot more. more. So the retirement board had approached. <laughs> That's where I was. <laughs> to see if there was any space available here in, in the town complex. Um, I met with um, Tom Gibson, and I had asked him if it was possible for him to enter a lease with a one year and then a year option to give us time to kind of plan to see if there, in a year's time if we can bring him in. I think that might be doable, but it, yeah. it involves working with all the other departments. Yeah, I think it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Sort of. So Mr. Chair, if I could just make one other comment, and this, yeah. this is uh, aimed at the uh, fiction writers on Facebook. I wanna make a couple of points very clear. I have no plans to retire anytime soon, and the town administrator, Patrice Garvin, is not pushing me out. This is an arrangement that we made collaboratively we did it in the best interest of the town. And I think the feedback we're getting here this evening is that you agree that what we're doing here makes the most sense for the town. Yeah, um, that sounds like some kind of fantasy novel. Uh, you can't chase down all those, face I don't look at Facebook. I don't look well, at I just, uh, it's, uh, it's rather unfortunate. All kinds of rumors that are circulating and I don't look at it. Yeah, some of them are very disgusting and vile, if I may say. And I, and I, but I will say this, the reality is- it's disappointing to hear that. Face, we, we face this, we all face this, right? Um, I went to bed last night, I was 39 years old, and I woke up this morning and I'm pushing 60. Um, so I, while I can sit here and tell yeah, you- Same dream. Yeah, yeah, same, uh, <laughs> yeah, well, I can tell you that I'm, as I sit here that I, that I have no plans to retire. Um, time flies. And so I don't know what the next two, three, four years are gonna bring and how quickly this may or may not happen. No, we, but I feel good that we're doing something, I think that's, that's important and something that's necessary. Um, and I, and my, my hope, obviously, uh, at the end of it all, is that the community um, feels that it was done in their best interest, and uh, and hopefully, in terms of services and providing service, we don't skip a beat. I'd also like to say, for the record, that I have always seen you, Jay and Patrice, work in an entirely collegial and professional matter. So, for what it's worth, the, cons the conspiracy theorists, um, I think you're a man of honor, integrity, and I appreciate you saying what you said. I appreciate that. Indulge it any further, actually. Look, I mean, to, to try to dispel and chase down these rumors and try to argue differently is, frankly, a waste of energy. Yeah. And so um, I think you all, we all know and you know that we're serving the community at the highest level possible. Right. And so to try to sort of argue differently with folks that just don't want to hear that, I mean, for, I've, I've learned in 12 years, it's not worth my time or effort. Yeah. I'm happy to engage with any resident in this community who wants to talk on a fact basis in terms of issues. But anyone who wants to talk about conspiracy theories and all of these sort of um, you know, rumors, if you will, it's not worth anyone's time, Frank, in my mind. I don't read it, I hear about it. Oh, all right. <laughs> well, don't read them. <laughs> yeah, so, um, I say Jay, but um, <clears throat> Glenn and Jay together, because this is kind of a, a fine tuning of the organization across both departments. Uh, do we need a motion at this time, or is, is no? It, we're just going to kind of continue to work to, to change. This over is the, the this the is the name. town administrator's decision to d develop. You know mm -hmm. how we reorganize. Okay. So it's not a select board. Uh, thank you for the informing yeah. us about it and walking us through it. But it sounds. But I will like, say she's kept us fully apprised of the problem. Oh, yeah. Agreed. And it sounds like an excellent plan. So we're going back to your uh, thing that we started about two hours. Thank you all very much. Appreciate it. Thank you. Right. thank you, Glenn. Good luck. Thank you, Glenn, for thank you foresight and all that. Right, uh, let me make one more slight deviation from the agenda and take up the uh, PQ basketball court, assuming that that's Jay Marcotte's that is department, Jay. because I would like Jay to be able to go home. At least we're not going to let it, what do you say, Patrice? Hmm? 
Yeah, they do. Oh. Oh, I think um. Okay. Oh, we may have a comment. Oh, Jeff. Sure. Good evening, Jay Marcotte, DPW Director. Um, this is very similar to the park project that I and I brought to you uh, a couple of weeks ago for uh, the Grove Street basketball and baseball fields. The, um, I'll make a long story short. This had one bidder um, for the PQ basketball court and the drainage. We had one bidder. They were high. Uh, not too high, but about $25,000 high. Um, we looked at this proactively with uh, finding funding for um, from Brandon's um, field revolving fund for about twenty five thousand. The ask is one hundred and sixty eight thousand um, six hundred. The reason is because not only did it come back high for the basketball court, but the whole time I had intended to do the drainage fix that needed to happen on the uh, southwest corner of PQ by the Maple Street. Uh, it floods, heavy rains. Um, the, the, I don't know what the name of the equipment, but it's the um, extra saucer set, um, or the exercise equipment that is in that corner. That whole area floods uh, heavy rain like today. Um, we knew that there was a drainage issue when we were looking at the CPA project back in 2016. We thought that, that we could get away with it with some modified fixes to the, to the topography. It didn't work. Um, lesson I learned way back when, um, for short money back then, we could have had this fix, but this fix is going to be about $19,000. Um, the engineering on including with that is about a 22 let's just say $20, $21,992. That I fully intended from day one to use st stormwater slash sewer funds to supplement this project. So the total project to Cataldo, the only bidder on this project is 168,000. I just had that and I lost it. $600. Uh, 35,000 from the stormwater fund, 25,000 from the um, field revolving fund and $124,592 that was approved at town meeting um, and the Community Preservation Act. I hope that quickly adds all that. So, Jay, did this, was the bidding so sparse because the bid was late? Did it go, late? Did it go out late in the season? No, it did not go out late. Um, it just, um, it was a timing thing. Uh, we tried to get it out right away in July and we didn't get it out in August. Um, we had the town field project going on. We had um, the Grove Street project going on. This is a heavy year for projects uh, with limited staff. So, yeah. Um, are you comfortable that, um, that this is actually a reasonable bid? You know, typically we'd like to see multiple bidders if possible. I understand the circumstances. Um, <clears throat> excuse me. From so Cataldo is the, the the bidder that bid on it. They are already here. Uh, they said if they weren't already here, they probably wouldn't even bid on this project. So they got Tom Field, and they also have um, the Grove Street project that was just approved. They're on site. They actually started on site uh, last Thursday. Um, if this is awarded tonight, we have a meeting with Cataldo this Thursday. On at PQ to discuss this project. Well, my understanding is they did a great job on on town field. Correct. But Jay, would they finish up this fall then if they got this? So they will get um, the drainage done. They will get the they will rip out the old basketball court. They will replace it with uh, the the post, and they will put binder down so that it will be usable. But in the spring, they're going to put final coat, final paint, finish all the grading, um, landscaping, and stuff like that. Uh, just for some historical reference on this, when the Recreation Commission first uh, submitted this to the Community Preservation Committee, the price was lower. Price got revised in January. These prices have been moving targets. We've, we've done our best to keep them accurate and up to date. Um, but, but there's been a history on a lot of these recreation projects of just the market's extremely volatile. People are probably tired of hearing that, but it is the reality. 
that, that our numbers have just been moving targets for a couple of years now, with everybody's best efforts and best intentions. Can I ask in terms of, so we have 124, 592 that's been approved by CPA, correct? So that was appropriated to town meeting. The money that, yes, you're, uh, so what you're not seeing is the consulting fee. I, my total, if you would read my memo, that's the total project. The consulting fee from Waterfield Design Group is part of that 124,592. If you add that 35,000 and then 25,000, you get the 184,000. Right, so that, that's what I wanted to do. Yeah, the math be quite quick. Go ahead. I'm asking for tonight is what I need to have approved um, for um, the project and the bid alternate. Because the rest so is the already motion is to approve one sixty eight six hundred. So we're, so now I'm confused. That is so that one sixty eight six hundred is Cataldo's part of their project. Okay. Our Where field. are the additional and is there an is there an appropriation? I mean, so we have twenty five thousand from the recreation field revolving fund. Correct. And thirty five thousand from the sewer stormwater enterprise fund. Correct. How can, can we draw down those funds without appropriation? In town meeting. Uh, stormwater, we can, and the revolving fund, we can. Yeah. So it does not need to be appropriated from town meeting? That's right. So is the motion, so, but hang on for a moment. We're approving the contract. You're approving the total contract of 168,000. But do we, does the select board also then have to approve the the, um, the use of these funds as described in this memo? I don't believe so. It's, it's just where we charge it to, where we charge the contract. Uh, so it's a little confusing is that the total cost of this project is 184,592. Correct. But the the contract that we're discussing is uh, 168. 168. So there's the difference, and the difference is the design. Is what is, is design? Pure design. And, and I did not, I, I, my math is to show you the total project. Yeah. But that tonight is to get the, the, it's the contract. Okay. The contract. Because I can't sign anything. About and, this right now. and then the, the funds are now coming from three different sources. Sorry. Correct. Um, and I guess it doesn't really matter uh, how the sources are mixed and matched in order to cover both the contract and the design fee. Okay. So again, this is a 35 and 25 plus the 124. And the quick math there, is that the 184? Correct. Yes. Sorry, okay. this is confusing. It was. No, no that's okay. Seems I mean, good. It is confusing. That's here. not your fault. <laughs> so, so that's 60 plus 124,592 is 184,592. Okay. Yeah. And again, just to confirm, the board does not need to approve the drawdown of the 25 from Rec Field Revolving Fund or the 35 from the Source Stone One Enterprise Fund? No, the, no we, can, we can do that. This is very similar to what we just did with the ARPA money for. The Grove Street. Well, opera money, we approve, we, we, we approve okay. that. You supplemented the project. Right. right. Well, relying on. I mean, I guess if, if the board doesn't agree with the, the stormwater no, and the volume, then we could, no, we could change it. No, not, I'm not suggesting that. I'm just trying to understand. Okay. We, we have an approach. So approach. there's been an appropriation. So presumably there's been an appropriation in the recreation field revolving fund. There's monies that sit in that revolving fund, correct? What we said at town meeting is the expenditure amount. We are authorized to expend, uh, what is it, 60? I think it might be 60,000. Does that impact that, that um, in terms of what we want to do with NREC? Brandon, Brandon worked it out that he would have enough money to cover him for this fiscal year. Okay, in terms of the sewer stormwater enterprise fund, that is, that's an enterprise fund we established to uh, manage uh, stormwater enforcement. Stormwater is your operating. operating. Operating budget. That's your operating, that's within your operating budget? Correct. For the sewer, the sewer enterprise. Yes, correct. Sewer, sewer and stormwater, combined okay sewer and stormwater. Yeah. So uh, again, was, the revolving fund, we're only allowed to expend what town meeting authorizes us to spend. Yeah. There's so those there. monies are in there. They're all in the budget. The, the, the 25,000 is in the, okay. The, uh, the revolving fund has already been appropriated. Yes. Not for this particular use. Right, and okay. the sewer budget Same. has already been appropriated. All right. All right. All right. I take a motion. I move to award Classic Park basketball court renovation contract to Cataldo Inc., Littleton, Mass., in the amount of 168600 Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Aye.
And sorry, it's confusing. And Jay, no did you say that this is where we're going to begin? I mean, September 18th, right? So this work's going to begin immediately. So they will rip out the old basketball court, replace with binder, have basketball posts and nets and everything in place. It will be usable. But then in the spring, they will put down final coat, okay. yeah. paint, landscaping, all that. It will be finished in the spring. I wonder whether Brandon was here. Was he here for that purpose? For this purpose? No, he was here. He was here the last time for the grass talk. I had no idea what he was here though. tonight. No, though. he was here because of the, the camp out. There. Oh, camp out. Oh, the camp out? Yeah. We're, we're, we're going to camp out in the select board room. <laughs> did, he, did, he, did he participate in the camp? The he did? He, was, he didn't stay, but he, he didn't, didn't stay. Ah, good for him. Thank you, Jay. Thank you. All right. Uh, indeed. Um, <laughs> we need to finish the high school debt thing, or? Yeah, well, there's two gentlemen here for some reason. Well, Once for an event, the bike event, I believe. Well, so let's, I, you know, it's. I don't know what audience is left for the high school debt exclusion, but we I should do that. Jennifer should take the finish because yeah. it's been hanging for an hour yeah. and a half. Okay. I'm bringing it. Jennifer. So Jennifer, we when we left off, you were going to discuss bond premium, which is a, a topic that can easily become confusing but let's try to distill it down to the um just one or two key points about you know what is a premium and what's the practical impact of it absolutely uh so thank you roy at at the time when when this was so a premium is essentially funding where the the bond purchaser where they're going to be giving us their funding and then we're going to be paying them back over the course of the 30 years they are pre-funding some of our interest at that point via a premium. The way that they, the reason that they do that is that then the, the bonds that they go out and turn around and sell on the open market have a higher coupon rate. So those are the coupon rates. We're actually paying an overall net interest that is in the two to 3% range, but the coupon rate that they are selling on the open marketplace is more like four or 5%. And so the premium is effectively just advancing that interest that they, then we are paying out over the course of the 30 years. The way that we treat that is that we resize the bond issuance so that the original 100,000 is reduced by the 5.5 in the case of the 2019. And it's it, the actual debt that is outstanding is only 94.4 yet we are paying an elevated interest rate um, on that debt that is being recouped via the premium. So it's a, it's a bit of a circular argument and it is very, it can be very difficult to get your head so around. The revenue you receive, is it a hundred million for that tranche? It absolutely is. But the debt service, the debt on our books is 94? That is correct. And the, and the, the um, and the slightly and the higher brokers that rate. sell our, our bonds, right, at the higher coupon rate, have prepaid us a premium of 5.5 million. That is correct. Okay. Right. Got so, that. Understood. Yep. Yep. So, in the end of the day, we, we, we in fact did raise $212,765,000 by issuing bonds. That is correct. Um, and the, the premium ultimately comes down to being a a complicated detail, but it's just a detail. Mm -hmm. That's right. But the reason that they pay, so to make the bonds more attractive to the marketplace, they pay a higher coupon rate. Is that the reason when they're selling they the bonds? They pay us the premium so that then they can, it, they can bar market a higher coupon rate. Yeah. Well, mm -hmm. there is a rationale for issuing bonds that promise a coupon that's higher than the market rate. But when you do that, you get paid a premium price for your bond and that's that's what the premium is but at the end of the day the out-of-pocket cost of the town is the same that's correct because you're paying we're actually paying a higher what's effectively a higher interest rate on a smaller face amount of bonds instead of a lower interest rate on a higher face amount of bonds but it comes out the same so that's why it's all the detail that's correct 
Okay. So I think the uh, the next the next slide is, is an important one, um, and I I had to go back and, and do some research around this, um, but we were able to locate a, a, a September 2018 um, newspaper article where we had um, Mr. Carmen had highlighted his debt projections for the middle and high school project. At that point, he was projecting an overall issuance of 215 million and he was expecting to go out to market three different times uh, for a total of that 215 million um, at a rate of four, four and a half, and then 5%. And at that point, he had projected the impact on the median home and the overall impact at that point was $1,810. Uh, I wanted to just highlight that we have traditionally used the per $100,000 value as the point of reference, but in looking at from one year to the next, it can be difficult to do that comparison because our, as you all know, or you've been living this, the last, you know, every year, your the value of your home goes up. And so the per 100,000, then that means the overall value of the homes in town also is going up. And so the per $100,000 value is not an apples to apples comparison. Um, so then, you know, now that now that we can look back and see that, you know, we we did have the benefit of really good market timing uh, when the bonds were issued. Um, there was a true interest cost that was considerably less than what was originally projected. And that true interest cost is count is averaging in the premium costs, as well as those face values of the debt and others to allow for a standard basis for comparing amongst the bids that are received. When we go out to market, we, we have, um, we've actually had some, um, my understanding is that we've had some good um, activity where there's been a lot of interest in our debt because it is so highly rated. And at this, um, it was 3.3% at the first one that compares to 4%. Um, 2.17% at the second, which compares to 4.5%. And then 4.15% uh, on the, the final round, which compares to 5%. And so in each of those, we um, the, the amounts paid in debt service by the Belmont taxpayer is going to be less because of those true issue, true interest costs. So the overall impact on a the median home taxpayer is uh, $1,504 as compared to the $1,810. Now I would note that there is, it is somewhat less in um, debt at this point, just for the sake of argument, you know, in the earlier conversation, we had talked about the fact that the MSBA has disallowed about $1.2 million worth of costs at this point. So we expect that we will be, we will be issuing the 1.2 million and then potentially somewhat a, a small amount on top of that if uh, the MSBA comes back and disallows additional amounts. Um, but we do have some room within the amounts that have been issued. I'm scrolling down just slightly, Patrice, if you don't mind. Um, if we get to just a quick projection on um, if we were to issue the an additional 1.2 million at a 5% you know, interest rate, uh, that would add an additional $11 onto the median um, home at this point. So that would be $1,500. Um, $11 for the median home value as of uh, yes. today, 1.4 yes, million. That's correct. So that would be $1,515. Per year, as it's um, compared to the 1810. Uh, so, because of that favorable borrowing environment, uh, the Belmont taxpayer has been um, has experienced a, a lower burden um, overall. You know, due to the high school, it is not, certainly not an insignificant burden by any means, but it is somewhat less than what had been originally projected. All right, I think. Everything Jennifer said is, is accurate. Uh, but we can't make this a seminar in bond, bond finance. Can you post this on our website so folks can actually look at it uh, to sort of understand? Because there, there have been a number of questions. It's, it is confusing. But at the end of the day, for the average homeowner in Belmont, the burden will be 15 
$1,515. And now just to be clear debt. that that is, there's a, that that is dependent on issuing 1.2 million of debt and um, um, at a 5% rate. So all of those, those fact, those two inputs could change. So if it goes up a little bit or if the rate is higher or lower, that could, could no, understood. And then I guess the other point to make here is that in the calculation which we had pending MSBA, so presumably the 5.5 million is pending, meaning that that's eligible costs and that will be reimbursed, right? The 5 million, 507, 920. So that's the assumption. Yeah. That's the assumption, but the holdback is an assumption as well. So mm -hmm. to the extent that there's any additional holdback, perhaps not anticipated. Um, well, I guess the, Bill and, and, and Tom presented to us that we do expect at some point to receive the, the five percent holdback once you know once they go through their audit and sort of determine and calculate that those are still those are eligible for reimbursement as well. That's correct. I think though it's important to note that while the MSBA is holding that back, we're still needing we 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 will have paid those bills already. Understood. And so in order to pay those bills, we will need to issue, issue some sort of short term. No, understood. Yeah, so, no, I do that, understand. That is not currently factored into the analysis no. at this point, but it's 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 a much smaller. But I guess the the if you want to call it a risk, the only sort of risk in this calculation is to the extent that MSBA on their holdback uh, increases their, you know, does not come forward with the 3.9 million that we're anticipating, which is not yeah. expected based on the presentation that we got from the chair of the Middle and High School Building Committee. Sure. Okay. Uh, any further questions, I would uh, ask people to email the board and we will um, come uh, answer questions individually at this point because we, we need to move on. Mr. Chair, can I make a yeah. quick comment? Um, Patrice and Jennifer included a very, um, I think, informative article from the Belmont Citizen Herald dated uh, September 26, 2018, uh, just because it does have implications for the, the override, but it is related. Um, it's quoting uh, then town treasurer Floyd Carmen. Carmen also believes there will be a need for a town operating override in 2021 and possibly another one in 2025, which includes the operating costs of the new school, growing school population, and other town capital project needs. You're looking at a debt exclusion November, uh, I think that must have been a 20. Taxpayers will start feeling that in their 2020 real estate tax bills, we might be able to stave off an operating override for a year or so, but there will be one in 2021 for four to five million, he said. Carmen believes the rising real estate taxes won't end with the operating override in 2021 if it passes. He said there most likely will be a need for a second operating override in 2025. Uh, just given that we know that we have an, op uh, an override in our future, I, I just want to emphasize this was always foreseen. This was not uh, building a high school without any sense of, of what it would cost and the impact that it would have on, on these override asks. We've had a failed override, even though uh, the town treasurer acknowledged at the time we need one in 2021. So here's hoping for 2020. Yes. Okay. Um, yeah, nine, ten. Do you want to take a short break or? Yeah, yeah well, you unless you want, Mr. Chair, it's fine if you want. But. Okay. Uh, so let us move on to our next agenda item, which is the fiscal 25 budget discussion. Um, so we put in front of you a calendar of upcoming oh, is that what that is? Yep. This is a um, proposed calendar. We distributed it to the Borant Committee I think last week. Um, this shows the upcoming budget forum, which is September 28th. That is something that Jennifer and I are working on uh, with the su superintendent. That'll be a public input session, really kind of how we got to where we are. You'll also see budget summits um, on there, select board meetings, obviously town meeting in November. So really this is just our attempt to outline what needs to be done by the schools and the town um, to propose two budgets to the town, one with an override, one without by the end of this calendar year. Patrice, is there going to be a, um, a web page devoted to override items? So currently, right now on the website, we have a, um, a budget tab. Um, we might be able to kind of change that to make it more of an override focused. I will say that when we went through the override last time um, in 2021, we had a tab just for override. I think it would be helpful because by the end of the year, there's going to be a lot of information that's going to be generated and it needs to be consolidated in one place. We are working with somebody um, also to help us kind of guide us through some of the communication pieces of this, given um, we want people to be well informed and understand all of the components of the override. Okay. 
during the last override process, um, Lori Slap and Anne Helgen had done a very informative set of slides and charts and tables. I don't know if we can find that kind of volunteer effort again, or if the, the consult can help with that, but they, they really distilled and clarified a lot of information and the charts were extremely helpful. Yeah, we, we've been discussing uh, uh, a revision of that approach, but with the same idea, maybe simplified a little more. Mm -hmm. So three budget summits planned for this calendar year and the fourth one, is that similar to what we did last year? The summits, yes. The public input on the 28th is a little different. We think we may need a few more of those, but we're gonna kind of play that a year. Um, public giving, forum just to sort of discuss, you know, get feedback. So, right, that. when we do the summits, it's really an opportunity for the, the collective boards to meet the, the public um, summits. There was a more for the public in general to ask questions. So we may have a few more of those by the, Definitely, probably by um, okay. the turn of the, of the new year, we'll definitely have some well, we, reforms. We're going to be reviewing, presumably by the 11th of January. Seems aggressive, but presumably by that point, yep. uh, the governor's budget hasn't yet been released, of course. Um, we'll be looking at um, potential um, override, no, no, no override budgets. So we've, yes. we've worked through sort of constructing, at least formalizing, you know, our 25 budget at that point? Yes, be, the okay. board has until February, I believe, 26th yeah. okay. to pick an override number. I'm not, I'm not d disputing the need to be at that point, but it's pretty aggressive timeline. It's extremely aggressive <laughs> timeline. <laughs> I, there are many I, aggressive things. Especially, do we have any sense of when we might expect our free cash certification? As I, as I feel like, a, again, a broken record, it's going to be late this year, not our fault. We're hoping by town meeting. Okay. But we can't guarantee it. Yeah, no, November, you mean? I, November. We yeah. to be certified. We we will yeah. be able to potentially project. Okay. 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 So I would just tell members of the public there are actually a lot of meeting dates here, particularly starting uh, in October, November. So mm -hmm. uh, keep your eye on the town website. We'll have banners on the homepage to announce upcoming meetings in advance, and we will find a way to post this calendar on the website and. Yep. Otherwise, publicize these things. So, built into some of our select board meetings at night or perhaps during the day, we'll yep. be meetings with town department heads. Uh, yes, yeah, so we plan on having this as a standard item between now and the end of the year, this particular item on every select board meeting. Okay. Okay. Thank you. I think we are targeting uh, the week of November 13th for your meetings with the department. Yeah. Okay. Is that at night or in the during the day? Okay. Okay, uh, anything else for budget discussion or we center our calendar to walk? Um, all right, uh, the next item is to open the budget, uh, sorry, open the warrant for the special town meeting. And uh, let us, what are we doing? So, so, so I'll, actually, I can bring up the list. Actually. Yeah, it's become quite a lengthy list all of a sudden. So again, the, a lot of this is placeholder, um, obviously dependent on when the board. So we have scheduled a meeting on October 13th. That's a Friday morning for you to finalize the warrant. This is when you sign it. This is when all the articles will be you know, firm and in place. This is a list of placeholder items still to be determined. So I can go through them if you'd like. Please. No. So the first item we have of for the warrant is the transfer of undesignated fund balance. That's free cash. Assuming we have free cash certified, you can't um, appropriate it at a town meeting until it's actually certified. Even if we had an estimate, we wouldn't be able to do anything until it's certified by the Department of Revenue. Um, we are going to request an amount to the stabilization funds, and we just we don't have that amount yet, obviously, because we don't have uh, for cash. The second is prior year bills. This is something that um, the finance director has uh, suggested we also put on every warrant. You never know when something's going to crop up and, and see. Can I, can I just ask, what, um, so the reason that we would, I mean, so we're in the middle of this, the budget summit and the 25 budget. Why are we moving funds into a staff fund from certified? Pre I think we're trying to plan and anticipate um, all options with the override. And if it doesn't pass, we feel that we, we should do some due diligence and put it into the stabilization fund. But at some point, you know, constructing the budget, we may decide to sort of draw down some of that staff funds. Potentially. But I, I, those are discussions that we have to have in the future. I think what we're thinking about is putting some money away um, to safeguard it until we-, we I'm, I'm okay with that, but it just seems redundant to sort of put money in the staff fund and then sort of withdraw it during the budget season. But doesn't the staff doesn't require two thirds vote to withdraw? It does. I think, I think our concern for budget planning purposes 
is we get to a, a point in time where an override may not be successful. We want to make sure that whatever money is used to fund the next year's budget without an override is carefully planned out. And we feel that putting in stabilization will, will force a, a, a town meeting discussion um, because it takes two thirds. I, I, I understand all of that. It's just, you know, um, here it is in November. We haven't quite constructed our budget and I'm not understanding for a while what things are looking like. And I'm just trying to understand. So we have operating. How do we decide how much we put into the stabilization fund? I think that's a conversation that we need to have. I think the other thing oh, that we yeah. have to be realistic about is there are capital needs that are coming. And if we spend, if we don't get the operating override and people want to spend all the free cash to fund one year, we are shooting ourselves in the foot of not having. No, I, I agree with all of the philosophical, yeah. philosophical points that you're making. I'm just trying to say, how do we how decide? Do we get to yeah. Will Without I, having sort of gotten to a point in terms of understanding what a no override budget looks like so or an override budget looks like. If I could, I think that we'd absolutely need to have that conversation. Yeah. And, and we need okay. to have- I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Yeah. Mark, I, I just- I'm Not quite ready to- We can move that. forward. I just- We're not ready. Debate. I just view it as a placeholder. It's a placeholder. It's a placeholder, okay. Yeah. And, yeah. If, and if, if the board determines they don't want to do that, we just pull it. Well, go ahead and just continue. That's right. Okay. So Roy's right. The second item is for your bills. We don't have any as of yet, but we're still working through. Current year supplemental budget. This is also things that we're determining whether or not we're going to need to bring forward. Obviously, anything in this year, we need to be able to set the tax rate in the fall in November. Yeah. So we have operating to be determined, capital to be determined. And I'm going to let Elizabeth speak to the community preservation um, off-cycle request that I know community preservation has been. So before everybody panics over the five projects, and I'm not going to go into great detail tonight, these are still under discussion. The three that very clearly qualify are, first of all, the uh, failing retaining wall. Um, I think that will be akin to our cracked chimneys where town meeting will see the photos and say, yes, please hurry. Uh, the second is, uh, the second two may require a little more discussion. The first we've already talked about, it's the supplemental request for phase 1A uh, funding for the tunnel, uh, the bike path tunnel underneath the railroad tracks. Uh, in discussions with uh, town moderator Widmer, my concern is that this will turn into an excuse to relitigate the entire uh, phase one bike path. But given that this is strictly tunnel funding and tunnel drawings, uh, we can explain very clearly that this was uh, completely an, an unanticipated expense precipitated by the MBTA's uh, change, you know, 180 on what kind of tunnel they wanted. And if, uh, if comments are limited strictly to the tunnel, again, my hope is that this will not consume an excessive amount of time. Uh, the third one. Tonight, are we? No. Sorry? Are we devoting on these tonight? No. No, I'm just okay. giving you a very, oh, okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. A very quick overview. Right. The third is uh, some failed uh, equipment at the pool, which if we don't replace, the pool cannot open this spring or summer. Uh, so again, um, where that could be complicated is the failure equipment uh, is based on some decisions that were made by the original building committee um, for some proprietary equipment that cannot be easily repaired or replaced. And so it's failed much sooner than it should have. Um, but again, if we don't do this, the pool can't open. So I think these, those are three, three very clear emergency requests. The remaining two, I don't want to go into detail on because there's discussions that are happening this week. Um, so there's some rec projects and uh, I can update you next week as to the status of the rec projects, both um, Chenery and uh, PQ. So would like to not discuss those further tonight. Happy to update you next week. Okay. Okay, next one is the um, special energy, energy code. This is Roger Rubel's um, citizens petition. Uh, in the spring that we had asked him to wait to defer to get some more information and push to the fall. So this is not on as this is the petition, this is on. When, when do we close the warrant by? Uh, we are signing the warrant October 13th. We're but closing we're it next week. But if we're including this article in there, do we need to meet with him again on this or we're not? So I need to meet with staff to understand some of the impacts to. Because um, is this going to be a select board sponsored article or is it a citizen petition? I believe it's a select board because right. that's what we promised them. Yeah, I, I think it should be a select board article, but there are some uh, aspects of it that, that we need to discuss. So. I, I, yeah, I will say no more on that. I agree. Okay, so when are we closing the? Closing it next week. Next week, what? The 25th. 
at the presumably at the conclusion of next week's meeting. Yeah. So this article presumably will be there. Yes. Okay. Yeah, I mean, we, we committed to doing it. I understood, but, yeah. but if you're working on some things, I just want to, you know, that's fine. Yeah. Well, we're working through some issues. We're looking to see what the impact is, but we're still proposing. Moving forward with that. Okay, forward. got it. Yeah, thank you. Sorry. Um, next article is, this is the restaurant. These are the actual sections of the zoning bylaw that will be amended. Yeah. I'm meeting with uh, the new town planner tomorrow, Chris, to discuss timeline and whether or not we'll be able to get it um, final wording by the 13th. Without final wording by the 13th and the planning board going through the process it needs to go through, um, we may not make it. It's it's tight, I'm not gonna lie, it's a tight schedule. There's there's statutory requirements on legal ads and planning board um, filing a report and it's, it's just really tight. Planning board is uh, discussing this tomorrow night for anyone who's interested, they're seven o'clock, it's on their agenda. Well, is it I mean, raised as a public hearing? I think it's important to include these. Yeah, so, now that. Okay, I'm sorry. No, so, they, they can only be included if the planning board has completed their hearing. Really. Right, and that has to be advertised. So, I, I'm a little concerned that, yeah, this is why I'm meeting with Chris tomorrow to make sure that the right steps are followed. I do need a vote of the board, though, to prefer this item in particular to, to the planning board, just to check that box, just to make sure. Yeah, that vote tonight? Okay. I, yeah. I think we should do anything we Please. can to facilitate this. But I mean, I, it's voting on language that we haven't seen. Yeah. No, you're voting to take the issue, take the issue and put it to the planning board to figure out. Yeah. But if, if we're closing the warrant on Monday night, you're saying it's tight. I mean, these are important articles, right? So, no, we'll put it on. We'll put it on, and then they have until the 13th to get final language. Because that's when you sign it. Oh, I see. Okay. So these, these are placeholders. These are all placeholders. Okay. Uh, okay, got it. Yeah, go ahead. And yeah. if it doesn't, if they don't make the timeline, it just doesn't go on the warrant that you sign. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Um, the last one is a citizen's petition. This was actually submitted to the town clerk. Um, it's a home rule, home rule legislation taxation of 61B uh, from Max Colas. Um, I attached it in your packet. Yep. There are citizen petitions floating out there that have not been submitted to the clerk. So there is. Um, I don't, I can't report on what I don't know. <laughs> so we'll find out um, once the warrant is, after the warrant's open tonight, we'll find out from the town clerk if anything And that has to be submitted. decided by Monday whether those petitions are in or not, right? Yes. Okay, yep. thank you. Yep. And then the, I, I also, I have not included civil service on this. I figured that's a conversation for next week. Yeah, it's, it's, we're not ready to talk about that. Okay. Okay, so, uh, in terms of votes tonight, we, uh, we we didn't we we have yet to formally vote to open the warrant. No, you haven't. No, we we need to do that, and we need to specifically vote on the planning board restaurant. You need to vote to open the warrant with the closing date of next week, and you need to defer the restaurant um, change of the zoning bylaw to the planning board for discussion. Re refer, not refer. 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 Did I say defer? Yeah. Refer. Refer. <laughs> What's, um, so, so let's just do both. So let's do the. So we want to refer the. What's the motion? So the motion would be to open the town meeting warrant. No, on, this is zoning. Oh, first. Uh, to defer the any yeah, possible the refer 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 any refer any possible um, <coughs> amendment of the zoning bylaw for section one point four, section three point three, and section six of the Belmont zoning bylaws to the planning board. So moved. Second. All in favor. Aye. Aye. So in terms of move and open, so opening, what time tomorrow we open the board? Are there times here? Is it 8 a.m.? Yeah, you can do 8 a.m. That's what time And then what time do we close it on the 25th? Close the business. We close it. What day is the 25th? 7 on the 25th. <coughs> 7 p.m.? Yeah. But Alan likes to have at least some little bit of wiggle. Why don't we just say 5 p.m.? That's fine. Move to open the special town meeting warrant on September 19, 2023 at 8 a.m. and close it on September 25, 2023 at 5 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Is that good? That's good. All right. And we will decide between now and Monday whether we're including the civil service article. Is that correct? Um, but you do have some time. I mean, you have until the 13th. I think we put it on as a placeholder. And then if... I would support that. By the 13th, you decide to take it off. Okay, I would support that. Well, that's, okay. Well, I know we're not going to talk about tonight, but I would support putting a placeholder on there. No, so very strong. Definitely point. support a placeholder. Yeah. Okay. Got got the get the point about whether we move forward with it or not. Mr. Chair, we have a raised hand. I don't know if you want a lot of public comment. No, there's a public. Uh, no, no, we don't. We don't have public comment. Uh, no. 
No, we do not. Not, not that. No, we're going to move on. Um, okay. Um, I think we have individuals here for common victuals license. Yeah, that's, uh, that's we're, we're back on track as far as the agenda goes. So um, sorry for the delay, everybody, but we're here to consider a common victual license for Teddy's Kitchen, uh, 462 Common Street. Are parties here for that? If not, we can do it. Nathan here? No. Uh, move to approve a new common victual license for Teddy's Kitchen located at 462 Common Street. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 All right, next is uh, a one day liquor license, beer and wine only for an event at the Beach Street Center. Move to approve a one day liquor license, beer and wine only for a private event at the Beach Street Center, Saturday, September 23rd, 2023, from the hours of 6 p.m. through 11 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Uh, before we go on, just a quick question. This seems like it's a private event. Uh, Patrice, this is just a placeholder. I think we, you and I had a discussion. We're trying to get a little more clarity on what does and doesn't require uh, a one day liquor license and uh, how absolute is our discretion in granting those. So just a reminder that yep. we wanted to get or try to get answers to that. Yep. Well, should we not have approved this then at that point? No, no, no it's, it's no. not related to this. It's something that's oh, okay. It's, okay. It's, it's Elizabeth being a little annoying. No, Elizabeth, that's fine. <laughs> you know, if we, you know, that's fine. Okay, uh, next item is uh, <clears throat> discussion. Ready? I think this gentleman is. Yeah, discussion. Mr. Morgan? Hi. Yeah. yeah. Paul Morgan, family. Okay. Family. Okay. Yeah, here for that. Let me just announce what we're doing here. Is that next agenda item is a discussion and possible vote for a family bike ride Halloween event on Sunday, October 22nd. We received quite a number of emails about this, and it looks like we have some members of the public who would like to speak to it. So, Mr. Morgan, please come up. I have handouts. We won't have time to go through them, but I'm going to use them as an aid to answer. You're here for, for this. Oh, thank you. Yeah. Uh, I'm Paul Morgan. I'm the main organizer of Family Bike Ride. We are experienced organizers of family events to promote biking and show families how to safely travel to various family-friendly locations in area towns. For late October, we are seeking to bring our Halloween ride to Belmont and Arlington. This would be our 10th event in three years. We are working with Friends of Belmont Community Path, um, who has a representative here, and the uh, newer Belmont Family Cycling Group for this event. The event would be a ride from Arlington to Belmont with a destination at Joey's Park. We have met with the police department and agreed on safety measures at key intersections with family bike ride paying for a police detail at Brighton Street and providing safety cones set up at Concord Avenue under the bridge. Um, and with our trained volunteers handling the more mild intersections. Uh, family bike ride will also carry out our own um, limited trash at Joey's Park, so there would be no impact on DPW. I'm aware of the trash history at Joey's Park um, from being a parent in the area. Um, this is um, not like a fun run. It goes through fairly fast, um, about five to seven minutes. Um, we are proposing a date of Sunday, October 22nd, arriving to Belmont approximately 10.15 a.m. For our rain date, we had originally proposed Sunday, October 29th, um, but at the town day event yesterday, I learned that the FBA, FBE has a fun run planned for that day. I was not able to complete my conversations with the park department on an alternative date, but I do not wish to conflict with their date. So um, we, for our rain date, we either wish to have an understanding that the town administrator would have the power to approve the rain date if the general concept is approved here, or we could come back for the rain date. At so I, I can speak to that. I, I did speak to Brandon about the conflict of the rain date, and we talked to the police chief. We don't anticipate there being too much of a conflict, given that your event doesn't, it's not that long past, past the, um, past the high school. So we think that if we just have some police presence that you Sergeant, um, there was a different response from, uh, I'm trying to pull up his name now. Murphy. What? Murphy? Yes. Yeah. No, we, we got that email 
before I, I talk to them. So I, I'm pretty, I'm okay. pretty confident that we are, we should, I think you should have the rain date, yes. Okay, with the rain date and the rain time, not shift it to the afternoon. Okay. I can confirm again with the chief and Brandon, but. Okay. I am a conservative person in sure. planning these events. I'm safety minded. I try to avoid ruffling any feathers. Where are you coming over from Route 2 here? I kind of can't quite. Where are you crossing Route 2? We we start in Mad Magnolia Park in Arlington. Right. And we go, we, we arrive in Belmont via the Fitchburg cutoff path. Look, the Minuteman in taking the pedestrian bridge over Route 2. No, this. No, it goes under Route 2 there. That's the, the Minuteman. So, um, you're looking on page. Oh, that's, min oh, that's Minuteman down there. Yeah. And half underneath Fine. Route 2. Fine. Okay. Yep. Yeah, we, we don't need to cross it because it's. Um, okay. It's underneath. It's clear to me. It runs uh, underneath. Okay. And we end up at Winbrook School? Yes. Did we do this last year? No, this is the first time. No. How many riders do you anticipate? I'm sorry. How many riders do you? Our lowest event in the last year was 125, and our highest event was 300. That's parents and children, so about half of those are children, half parents. Okay. And they're they're going to be on Concord Avenue from the Millen High School through Belmont Center. Well, we turn underneath and then we go on Channing Road. So we're not going to go on um, Leonard Street. Um, we're no, I understand to... that, but I mean, prior to that, you come around, say, yeah, we want to come have... down Hittinger. Is that it? No? Yes. Yeah, so, um, you know, I've been on this route many, many times. Yeah, no, I'm just trying to understand it. Okay, now I get it. But thank you. Um, okay. It, my only okay. question was police details and you're covering the cost of that. So um, I, I think it sounds like a fun, happy event and nice opportunity for uh, families to get out and exercise together. I can say something on behalf of the friends, the Belmont Cube half. Um, we were excited when Paul and his group reached out. By yourself. Uh, Jared Gensel, uh, president of the Friends of the Belmont Community Path. Um, we were excited when when their organization reached out said they wanted to do the next bike ride into the Belmont area because I think it features some of the amenities that by, that families can come to with some of the investments we've made in the town. So we want to really try to feature what Belmont Center has to offer uh, in our promotions of the of the event as well. And just welcome the broader Boston community into the Belmont community. Yep. All right. All sounds good. Hope for good weather. Yeah. Uh, Great, thank you. Yeah, and I think Sunday is a perfect day to have it. You know, not yeah. a lot of traffic on Concord yeah. Avenue. Does our motion have to include the proposed rain date as well? Yeah. Okay. What's the proposed the rain date? It doesn't. It only includes October 29. So, what's the actual uh, expected time that the ride would uh, pass through Belmont? We start our gathering at 9:30 in Arlington. We leave at 10. I would expect we would get to hit to Brighton and Hittinger around 10 15. okay i have 10 40 here so, so park around change that yeah change that to 10 15 to 12 20. our motion reads 10 40 to 12 20 p.m so um, um joey so i originally applied for just so specific on the times i mean is it important to be specific? Specific, but whatever it is you'll have our details going to be present that whole time the police detail is just to cross Brighton Street and in our meeting with the police department and the town administrator, we decided that the other major intersection, which is where Concord Avenue goes under the train bridge, that since that is um, two right turns, we would set up cones to effectively extend the bike uh, lane around the corner. Um, so yeah, that, that's fine. You know, we're not blocking any cars in that situation. Okay. So 10, 15 to 12, 20 p.m. Is that yeah. it? Move to approve the family bike ride Halloween event for Sunday, October 22nd with a rain date of October 29th, 2023 from 10, 15 a.m. to 12, 20 p.m. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Ms. Morgan. Thank you. All right. Good luck with that. Yeah. 
Lord. Good Lord, indeed. Uh, well, they okay. Quick here. Yeah, let's right? move okay, quickly let's through the uh, any resignations. Uh, so, uh, I can read them here. Move to accept the resignation of Zen Zen. Zen 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 from the Youth Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Move to accept the resignation of Chris Bouge, Bouge from the Youth Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move to accept the resignation of Christine Arthur from the Shade Tree Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move to accept the resignation of Joshua Gould from the Recreation Commission. Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Thank you for your service to each of those individuals. Okay, thank you. Okay, just as a heads up, uh, not only do we need to appoint somebody new to Shade Tree Commission, they got a request to revise their charge to increase the size of that committee. So we-, we Really? Uh, okay, how many are on it now? I think seven. seven. The, the, we, One more? At their request, we shrank it two years ago, but now that we're going back up. Okay, I think it's fine. I think we should maybe say up to nine. Up to nine, yeah. Do you need that many people on that? Well, right. saying up to nine, that way, if it goes back down, they... Right. Okay. I think that's better. Yeah. Um, okay. Board. All right. Next to... Uh, let me scroll. Happy to do the ed Education Scholarship Committee, Mr. Chair. Yeah. Um, we have two recommended sort of... Um, we have a reappointment recommendation and a point recommendation. So I move to re three year term. I move to reappoint uh, Jen Jen Sun. Jen Jen Sun, sorry, thank you for a three year term to expire 63026 to the Education Scholarship Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. Uh, Aye. And I move to appoint Aurora Sen Feliz a three-year term to expire 63026 to the Education Scholarship Committee. Okay. All in favor? Aye. 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 Okay, next, um, next is Transportation Advisory Committee, where there are uh, three reappointments and then a... Do we have any recommendation from the chair on who to appoint? Well, let me, let me get to that in a moment. Okay, thank um, you, Mr. Chair. I, yeah, I had a couple of questions and concerns on this as well. But. So let's start with uh, the reappointments. Who's I mean, to reappoint David Coleman to a two-year term? Yeah. Are these two-year terms? These are two-year terms? Uh, yeah, I'm surprised to see that. I didn't realize that these were two-year terms, not two-year two terms? That's fine. I think the charge is two-year terms. Of term, two years. Yeah. Okay. Move to reappoint David Coleman for two-year terms to expire 6-30-2025 to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move to reappoint Ken Lynn to a two-year term to expire 6 25 to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Move to reappoint Jeffrey Roth a two-year term to expire 6-30-2025 to the Second. Education Advisory Committee. Second. All in favor? All in favor. Aye. 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 Okay, re regarding the vacancy, <clears throat> for quite a while, uh, we had a, a single applicant. And uh, one reason I uh, wanted to defer taking action on this was to see if more people would step forward. And uh, indeed, just last week, uh, uh, more people did eat as it happens, uh, submit their interest. And I, I have to say that Catherine Barada, uh, who applied on 9-11, uh, I believe, just a week ago, was the type of person that I was actually hoping would step forward to serve in this committee. Let me tell you why. I mean, she's a long-term resident. In fact, she grew up in Belmont. But I think more importantly, uh, she actually has training in traffic engineering. She has a civil engineering degree, worked as a professional traffic planner for a number of years until she uh, did a complete uh, career switch and I believe became a physical therapist. But nonetheless, uh, her background is in engineering and traffic engineering and we don't, you know, we, we need more people, I believe, of that caliber serving on this committee. Uh, plus, uh, for what it's worth, and I, I think it's worth something, that it's, uh, she's part of a, uh, I would say, the <laughs> next generation that's stepping up to serve in these committees, and I think we should encourage people to, uh, to serve in this capacity. So when somebody is, uh, satisfies basically every criterion, uh, in my mind, I, I would strongly 
recommend appointing Catherine Barada. So Roy, I had the same response. My one question was, I didn't see a resume. So have you had a chance to verify? No, we just have the description, right? Credentials. The credentials yeah. So I will say, I know the Barada family, they are brilliant. There are a lot of engineers in them. The parents, they're longtime residents. Um, so I, I don't know Katie, but I do know her parents quite well. And I know some of the other siblings and uh, they are longtime residents. They are committed. Katie has been certainly vocal on other issues. And above all, for these specialty committees, when we can find someone who has relevant background and work experience, it's incredibly valuable. Um, just my, my only question was any any further knowledge about the, the depth of her experience? Uh, I have not specifically interviewed her, but I, um, but I said what I know. Okay. It, 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 again, it's, it's entirely on point. It's entirely relevant. She has chimed in on other transportation related issues. <clears throat> Since you're so actively engaged in transportation advisory committee ma matters, I would I would take your uh, recommendation. Um, under advisement and move forward with this appointment. I'm, I'm, I'm willing to do so as well. Again, I certainly want to thank my knowledge the of other the sort of applicants. Okay. You've gone from one to five. Uh, Mary Lewis, Roman Lutz, Mr. Ron Sacker, who's attended a couple of our meetings, and Ms. Uh, Ida Weiss. So, uh, but, but I'm, high, I'm fine to appoint Catherine Parada if you feel so. Yeah. Let me say the, the other applicants are yeah. are outstanding citizens as well, and we will right. absolutely find other places to uh, to put there. So, uh, with that, I move to a, it's a one-year term. Yeah, well, this is this is a an appointment to fill a term that was an appointment to fill a term. So, uh, so ho hopefully, this person will fill the term and then be renewed on June thirtieth, twenty twenty-four. We have no recommendation from the chair, current chair, right on this. There was a request by the chair to appoint Mary Lewis, but that was back in the spring before Catherine Barada okay. applied. All right, and well, I, she was only applicant to it. All right, uh, Mr. Chair, uh, I move to appoint uh, Catherine, Catherine Barada to a one-year term to expire 6-30-2024 to the Transportation Advisory Committee. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Um, Mr. Chair, uh, I wonder, I know that we have an executive session coming up unless there's other business. Yeah. Um, and then we may come out to ratify um, the contract. Should we Should we do this? Um, I don't know the advance of funds in lieu of Bari. When we go into the executive session, we lose everybody. Yeah, I think we have to come out of the executive session anyway. But uh, we, we should we do that we, first, and then and then we, we can do the advance of funds just to. Yeah, I'm not, not, not quite certain what that's about. And we still have some fans online. Sorry, Chief. <clears throat> Quite understand what this is about. Chief, your pain is also our pain. <laughs> this, it, it should be quick. Chief, it's so early, and you came. What time do you come here? Seven. Yeah. It's uh, it's seven, eight, nine. God bless you for hanging in there. Believe us, forty-five. As badly as you would. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So th this is th this is necessitated by the fact that the rink project is moving ahead so quickly. What, what is this? Yeah. They need money in advance of the actual bond issue that will fund the rent. So okay. this is a so, proposal to advance our own money. Sorry, Jennifer. To That's fine, Roy. Oh, go ahead. What is this about? We, we do have funds that are available that we could advance for this purpose, and then we will repay ourselves when the bonds are issued. And I, I think that's what's going on here. That's exactly right. In an ideal world, we would have already been we would have already issued the debt in anticipation of, of starting work on a project. A bit because we did just have the project approved in April, and the project has been quickly getting underway. You know, since that point, and in fact, we're still kind of finalizing cash flows with them as as we're going through. Um, but we wanted to dot our eyes and cross our T's. Um, because if we are going to be self-financing any projects, we do need to complete this form, have you all as the authorizers of debt approve the self-financing and have it on file with the state. Um, and they also limit us to how much we are able to authorize. So at this, as you can see, we are, we need to look at either the amount of unappropriated free cash, the value of the stabilization fund as of June 30th, 1% uh, of the FY24 budget. Um, and, and between those three numbers, we the largest one is the amount that we are able to advance finance. And so we're asking you today, uh, we had 
unappropriated free cash of 4.358 million. And so we're asking you to authorize the, the amount of 4.358 million um, for us to spend on the, on the rink prior to issuing debt for that project. What's the plan of issuing debt? Well, I'm still working with our advisors on that. Okay. Uh, it could be as early as November. Um, oh, eight weeks from now? Yes. Okay. So, so, so this this is in no way, and maybe just to clarify, because this can be confusing the community. The cost for the rink is still as anticipated, right? Um, which was, um, I just looked at the numbers, twenty million six hundred fifty three oh thirty two, right? Is that that's the loan? I thought we had amount of loan authorized twenty eight million. That's what is, right. Who authorized that? It was the town meeting. Town meeting. Mm -hmm. So that's the cost of the rink. We haven't yet issued a tranche of bonds to sort of begin the process of paying our bills, correct? That's right, that's correct. So in anticipation of eventually doing that, we want to advance funds to pay our bills. And then once uh, the bond issuance takes place, we'll receive the revenue from that and we re, 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 uh, reimburse the amount appropriated from free cash. Well, it, it realistically, we have a, a number of different bank accounts. And so we're using those various bank accounts to fund our bills on an ongoing basis. And the source of, of funding is just, it's, it's all pooled cash. And so realistically, we're just simply pulling from one of those available sources to pay the bills. And then the, but the, as you said, the bonds will be replenishing that. I might, if I might, um, we did also accept a number of donations from donors and those, that funding it did go towards paying those, those initial bills. And if we are able to accept a donation from the Belmont Savings Bank Foundation, then that would also help with this project. This has to be approved by the Division of Local Services. So we approve it and then DLS has to approve it as well? Um, no, we just have to simply send them a, a letter or we have to send them a copy. So Jennifer, I take it that this form identifies a maximum amount that DLS thinks is prudent. That's correct. And, and get, if the, the bonds would really come to market in November potentially? That is as early as we could bring it. Or, or maybe, but even if it was December or even January, mm -hmm. <laughs> this is, making available a fairly large sum of money, the burn rate is not going to be that large. So we, we wouldn't go through $4 million by November or December, I would think. Well, if you speak to the building committee, they yeah. are talking about pre-ordering and pre-paying for prefabricated buildings and, oh, okay. and things like that. So um, I'm, I'm meeting with Mark Haley in the morning and I'll be asking him a little bit more you know, about that. Um, but so this is a, an abundance of caution and trying to, again, dot my I's and cross my T's. Uh, can, can I just ask, um, Mark stated that the cost of the building is the 2865332, but that's actually the, what we're borrowing. It doesn't the cost also include the donated amounts? That is the cost of the borrowing. That is so there's the borrowing plus yeah, the donation, the total cost right. of the building, just so that nobody right. thinks that we've said it's a $28 million building when it's actually more. So That's a good point. Yeah, because we're doing a million dollars from Belmont Savings Bank Foundation and a number yeah, of and other donors have stepped up on this. To yeah. Very grateful. I mean, I, I just think it's, in, no matter what we say, I mean, there's going to be, you know, people will just sort of turn into something else. We're not looking a more for this building. We're exactly. just advancing yeah. funds in anticipation of issuing bonds that will replenish the funds that we're advancing. Yeah. This is what every community does in, in, okay. every, All right. okay. in every part of the state. Thank you for that clarification. Appreciate that. All right. So, All right. I move to approve the advance of funds in the amount of $4,358,000 in lieu of borrowing for the skating rink. Second. Favor. Aye. Aye. Right. Um, so we are ready for our executive session. Okay. Um, I move to um, for the board to go into executive session to conduct strategy sessions and preparations for negotiations with non-union personnel, or to conduct collective bargaining session or uh, contract negotiations with non-union personnel. Uh, the fire chief and also the police union, Patrice? Uh, says police? Yeah. Yes, police union. Yeah. Police union. Okay. Second. Second. Roll call. Elizabeth Dion, aye. Mark Flo, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. And we will return to open session.
Okay, let, let's have a motion to return to open session. Um, I move that we return to open session. Second. Roll call. Uh, Roll is Mark Lowe, aye. Roy Epstein, aye. Okay, um, <clears throat> so one of the items we discussed in our executive session was finalization of the contract with Fire Chief uh, Dave DiStefano, and we have reached an agreement. Uh, uh, Kelly from HR will review the the specifics of the contract, but let me just say that it, the negotiation uh, reflected the select board's approach to setting compensation levels with reference to uh, relevant benchmarks of surrounding communities. And that guided the number that uh, was reached by mutual agreement. Uh, we considered roughly a dozen uh, surrounding towns of comparable size and made adjustments to render different salary packages comparable. And we, we think that uh, we have ended up at a fair place, which is at the median of the um, comparables. And that number is $180,000, which will be reached, not now, but on July 1 of next year. Uh, in in a contract structure that Kelly will describe, but the the new salary for the fire chief will be one hundred and eighty thousand dollars starting July one, and the term of the contract will run through uh, two thousand twenty seven. Is that right? Um. Yes, 2027. Yeah, because it's three years. March of 2027. Yeah, because that'll be the third year anniversary from 2024. Okay, so with that, Kelly, if you could briefly uh, summarize the principal features of the contract, that would be helpful. Sure. Um, so the salary for the fire chief will go from 1,600. Or one thousand, yeah, one thousand sixty-eight hundred six hundred forty-two dollars. No, 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 no. One hundred sixty-eight thousand. Yeah. Oh, sorry. Did I add an extra hundred in there? Yeah. Um. One hundred sixty-eight thousand. Getting late. Um. Ready. So from one hundred sixty-eight thousand to one hundred seventy-seven thousand, effective March fifteenth, twenty twenty-four, um, and then taking the cost of living increase into consideration for July 1st, that 2% will bring him up to the 180,000 um, benchmark that we that we have agreed upon. Um, and then from there, the contract language will stay the same for the, for the next two fiscal years um, with a cost of living increase of at least 2% um, or greater if you know, determined based up by the board. Um, and then additionally, the chief will be granted a stipend for being on the local emergency planning committee, which equals out to $3,500 annually, which will be paid on July 1st. Hey, uh, Elizabeth or Mark, did you wanna make any comments about this contract? Uh, I, my comment is that we uh, have top talent. Unfortunately, we cannot pay, afford to pay uh, what, what top talent might be worth, but we can at least hit the median, which is our goal. Um, that we really, really appreciate the work the chief does. We are very fortunate to have him. We have um, a front row view of the fact that he pretty much works 24 seven and we're deeply appreciative and uh, appreciate all that he does. So thank you, chief. I agree with those comments, and uh, you know, frankly, I mean, um, we have a very talented uh, group of department heads, and I think it's really important to pay at least at the median level. Uh, we're not paying at the highest level, uh, we're not paying at the lowest level, but we are paying on average on the average or median level, and I think that's important to uh, recognize the uh, the efforts and, and the performance by our current uh, fire chief. Yes, and I'm delighted that uh, this this was a an agreement that was viewed as fair by both sides. And uh, I think it will lead to another very successful three-year term for the fire chief. Mr. Chair, you want a motion? So I move that we uh, ratify the employment agreement between the town of Belmont and David DeStefano, who is our fire chief, effective March 
15, 2024, to run for a three year term through March 15, 2027. Second. So all in favor? Aye. 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 Thank you, Chief. Congratulations. Aye. Thank you. Thank you very much. Have a good well, night. Good night. Thank you for hanging a in. Very, a very, very long day. Roy, what minutes are we doing? So we have um, two sets of minutes. Uh, one from August 30th, that was our community path discussion, and the other from September 7th. I had a number of edits to October uh, to August 30th. I don't know if anybody else. I sent an oh, extremely it's... minor additional edits. Oh, was that to August 30th? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. The August 30th or the September 7th? I had no changes to the community path committee minutes. Oh, all right. So August 30th, I was the only one. So I moved. No, I, uh, I made additional changes. You cha made changes. I made additional changes. Very minor. Wait, to which August. ones? So let me find. Hold on. I thought it was September 7th. That's what you made changes that's to. That's what I thought. Oh, uh, I made whatever Roy made changes to is what I made. I, I changed yeah, he did both. Yeah. Uh, I didn't realize there were I move approval of the August 30th, 2023 select board minutes as amended by um, uh, Roy Epstein. Uh, I think I second. Second. Are you all in favor? Aye. Aye. Okay, and then there were uh, minor edits by both Elizabeth and me to September 7th. Move approval of the September 7, 2023 regular session select board minutes as amended by uh, Roy Epstein and uh, Elizabeth Dion. Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 And I think our business for the evening is concluded. Uh, I move uh, to adjourn. Second. All right. <laughs>